Yes. So, welcome all participants to our third quarter board meeting. Uh, it's always great to see you. I hope you have all been keeping safe and managed to have some good family time over the summer or winter break in your part of the world. Uh, I maintain and I hope you maintain a positive outlook and hope that the pandemic will come under control soon uh, as vaccination efforts continue in all countries around the world. Uh, so let's keep optimistic and keep our fingers crossed. I want to welcome our official observers, Robert Buchanan, our PIOB observer, first of all, and also Junpei Kato from the Japanese FSA. Hello, Junpei, and Galen Hansen, our CAG chair. I also want to extend a warm welcome to Diane, Diane Jules, following her leave of absence for part of the summer. Diane, it's really great to have you back. Welcome, welcome. Also, uh, a special greeting and welcome to Richard Fleck, attending the rollout session on September 13th, the benchmarking session on September 14th, and the long association session on September 17th. And uh, knowing Richard's love for IESBA, I think he'll be observing most of the remaining sessions. So Richard, if you can hear me, welcome and a very warm greeting to you. And an equally warm greeting to Sylvie Soulier, uh, who I think is with us this morning and who will of course be conducting the uh, engagement team group audit session on the 27th, which is the very last meeting uh, that we're having this month. And I know Sylvie too, who has long service in IESBA, will be attending and observing most of the other sessions. Uh, also greeting to Denise Canavan, who is involved with the same project, engagement team and group audits and has also been a colleague for a long time and is observing today. Welcome, Denise, welcome, Sylvie. The PI session, which we will have uh, today, as soon as I'm finished with my introduction, will be observed by uh, several members and uh, associated persons with the IWSB PI working group, Josephine Jackson, who is a correspondent member on our PI task force, Shun Wee, uh, who is also a corresponding member and member of the IWSB uh, working group, Denise Weber, member of the working group of the IWSB, and Kalina Shukarova, Natalie Klonarivis, and Megan Hartman from IFAC. Uh, Kalina and Natalie are from the IWSB. Welcome all. Andy Mincer and Michael will have notified me that they will not be able to attend some of these sessions. They will be giving us written remarks uh, for those sessions. We have 24 public observers who will be observing the meeting uh, through our live uh, YouTube channel, which, which is transmitting right now, I believe. Welcome to you all public observers. Now, as you're aware, uh, we have well, uh, quite, quite a big agenda in this meeting. And um, of course, this meeting is going to be very important for a successful December meeting. We expect that in December, will be approving hopefully our PI standard and we will be also approving two exposure drafts. So our agenda today includes all these interesting and other interesting subjects. We'll of course start with PI uh, today uh, and um, the task forces work after having uh, reflected on the results of the consultation, the exposure draft, Tomorrow, starting at midnight Eastern time, we will have the executive session 
and we'll discuss benchmarking uh, the working group's proposed phase one reports. On Wednesday, we will begin with the EIOC session uh, with a presentation of the joint EFAC uh, and AICPA SEMA report titled The State of Play in Sustainability Assurance. And following that, Vanya will lead us into our first discussion, board discussion on ESG and ethics. Also on Wednesday, we'll receive a presentation on cybersecurity, uh, which the technology working group has arranged, and it will be followed by an update from Brian on that working group's activities since last meeting. On Thursday, we are going to the technology task force work and the first read uh, presented by Rich, who is chairing that task force. We will then receive a presentation from um, IFAC on the new digital platform from the for, the, for all the international standards, which of course is housing our uh, e-code. Um, on Friday, we will focus on Jens' presentation of the Tax Planning Working Group final report and recommendations and the project proposal. Um, after that, Richard Fleck will present key issues in the responses to the Long Association post-implementation review, phase one questionnaire, and that working group's recommendations. So on the final day of the meeting, as I said before, we will have a first read of the engagement team uh, group audit uh, task forces, proposed revisions to the code. Uh, as you see, this is quite a heavy, but also quite an exciting uh, agenda. And I'm sure we're going to have very lively discussions every one of those days. I want to thank the participants who have provided advanced comments on the agenda material to the relevant uh, task forces and working groups. There are several of those comments. Um, and of course, I want to thank all task forces and working groups and the staff for the very hard work that they've uh, put uh, into the preparation of this meeting and the agenda materials today. Um, and of course, a special thank you to you, to board participants who will be joining the meeting at on social hours in your time zones, uh, sharing the pain as we had agreed in this meeting as well. Your dedication and your commitment are uh, very much appreciated by me. They're a testament to the work of the board and uh, to its devotion to the public interest. Let me uh, remind you that uh, the schedule of recent outreach and related activities is in agenda item 1B that has been circulated. I want to thank all board participants who have taken part or will take part in outreach activities. If you have uh, already participated or will participate um, in um, outreach that we have not recorded, please let us to know so that we can have a full record of outreach activity. A brief update on the planning committee uh, activity. The planning committee met via teleconference in July and September, twice since our last uh, meeting. The topic discussed included an, updating on <clears throat> an update on a meeting with representatives of the EFR Standards Coordination Working Group, update on all work streams, the PIOB's updated list, list of public interest issues, revised proposed guidelines for ESMA involvement in non-authoritative material, transition planning regarding the monitoring group, uh, recommendations and an update on discussion between uh, ESBA and the IWSB leadership with the EOSCO Sustainability Task Force. We'll be touching on some of these uh, topics either in our executive session or in our public session as we go forward. We held a successful CAG meeting on September 7th, during which we had quite productive discussions on tax planning and on technology. Um, 
the joint IWSB uh, IESBA CAG meeting was also held on September 8, where the pipe project was discussed at considerable uh, length. I want to thank uh, Jens, Brian, Rich, and Mike, um, who took part in that meeting, and they will report on the feedback from uh, the CAG meetings during their respective uh, sessions. We have an additional CAG meeting planned for September 20th to discuss the engagement team group audit uh, independence project, as well as the long association and bar benchmarking initiatives. So with that meeting, we'll have covered exposure to the CAG of all our important projects, the whole uh, set. I would like to invite Galen at this point, if he wants to share any remarks or observations from the CAG meeting. Galen? Yes, thank you, uh, Stavros. I, I thought we had, a, as you characterized it, a very active uh, participation in uh, the discussions on, on those topics that uh, you had mentioned. And, uh, you know, uh, not unsurprisingly so. So nothing specific as they come up during our meeting. Uh, I'll chime in, though. Thank you. Thank you very much, Galen. Yes, indeed, you'll have an opportunity if we discuss the specific projects to uh, put in a word from the CAD meeting. Thank you. M might I say, Stavros, there was much, much discussion on the ESG uh, matters, and that will come up in this meeting as well. So. Right. Uh, I, I too must say that I was very pleased that I saw CAG participation being very active and very broad uh, in that meeting, and that's always a good sign. Uh, so thank you, Galen. We'll uh, hear more about this as we do the projects. Now, with respect to the tax planning project, subject to the board approving the project proposal on Friday, I... Uh, we will have to uh, form a new task force for that. And I would like to say that I welcome expressions of interest from any board member or uh, uh, technical advisor who would like to join the new task force. If you're interested, please let myself or Ken know by the end of this Wednesday, day after tomorrow. Of course, we will give some priority to working group members who have, um, who would like to join the new task force. Uh, but anyway, please express your interest so that we can make a decision and announce the task force composition on Friday as we deal with the tax uh, project. Now, regarding our December meeting, uh, the board meeting. In June, I had indicated that travel conditions permitting, we were planning to hold a hybrid board meeting in uh, December uh, with board members who are able to travel meeting in person in New York and those unable to travel joining virtually. We have confirmed the dates of the meeting, which are November 30 to December 4th, uh, December 8th, and December 16th. I have been in contact, of course, constantly with Tom Seidenstein, uh, the IWSB chair, to coordinate our approaches to our December board meetings. This will also depend on whether the IFAC offices will be open to visitors. They're not now. We are monitoring the latest COVID developments and expect to make a final decision at the end of this month or by early, by early um, October at the latest. I'm, of course, keeping my fingers crossed and I appreciate very much your patience. Uh, it would, of course, be wonderful if we could meet in person. And this concerns me very much personally as well, since December will be the last board meeting for me and for other members who are completing their terms at the end of this year. Of course, if conditions do not permit, we'll meet virtually. Now, um, on a few other matters I would like to inform the board about. First of all, in order to secure additional support 
to the technology task force while Diane was on leave. We have engaged Richard Fleck to provide technical support to the technology project until the issuance of the exposure draft. Richard has already made uh, long and helpful contributions to the development of the revised technology test, text, which we will be discussing next um, on Thursday. I want to thank Richard very much for his diligence and his uh, uh, hard work. Um, on minutes, uh, we have distributed minutes of the June public session to the board for review. Uh, I hope that you have seen them all. If you have any comments, please email them to us to by September 22nd. I will be asking the board to approve the minutes on the last uh, meeting day, which is September uh, 27th. Okay. With that, I believe I have completed my presentation uh, to you. Yeah, I don't see any other points that I have to bring up at this point. I will be uh, talking more about specific points as we go forward. So I believe that we are ready to proceed to our first item on our agenda now, which is, of course, the definitions of listed entity and PI. This is, I would say, by far the most important project we have on our hands right now, not only because of its significance per se, but also because the, uh, of the uh, time plan that we have to complete this project successfully in December. So I will invite your uh, reflections and your dedication to being clear and constructive as possible in discussion so that we can move forward towards finalization of the project. With that, I would like to invite Mike uh, to take the floor and make his presentation. Michael? Thanks, there, Ross. I'll just wait for. <coughs> That's it. That looks like it. Okay. <coughs> um, so, as Stavros says, what we are trying to do here is get all the way through a first read of the uh, standard in the hope that we get reasonable agreement at this meeting, uh, certainly on any key areas and we can therefore take forward a final version for December. If you can flick onto the next slide, Diane, we are going to look at what the sort of summary of the significant ED comments. We went through some of this uh, at our meeting in June, but to go a bit further into that and to provide input to our responses and proposals in response to those comments. We go on to the next slide, uh, and I'll skip over this very quickly. You will recall that the key proposals included introducing an overarching objective for the additional independence requirements for PI entities, providing guidance on factors to be considered when determining the level of public interest in an entity, expanding the extant definition of PI to a list of categories of entities that should be treated as PIs, but subject to refinement by relevant local bodies, we looked at replacing the term listed entity with a new PI category, publicly traded entity. We were proposing to elevate the extant application material, which encourages firms to determine whether to treat additional entities as PIs to a requirement. And we included some enhanced guidance on factors that firms might consider in that context. And lastly, we had a transparency requirement, i.e. that firms should disclose if an audit client has been treated as a PI. If you go on to the next one, as part of the exposure draft, the PIED also saw preliminary reviews from the IAASB stakeholders and those matters which affect the IAASB standards, in particular, the use of a common overarching objective in establishing differential requirements for certain entities for both board standards. 
whether uh, on a case by case basis, it should be determined whether the differential requirements for listed entities should be more broadly applied to other high categories. And lastly, whether disclosure that we were suggesting should be within the auditor's report that the firm has treated uh, an entity as a pie. If we go on to the next slide, just to sum up the breakdown by respondents, um, hardly surprising, I suppose, because it's a slightly technical area. Most of the respondents were either regulators, PAOs, firms. We didn't get very much from investors or even those charged with governance. As I say, I, I don't find that altogether surprising. It is a slightly esoteric subject for the, those who are not uh, familiar with our standards. But that gives you an overall breakdown. I think the geographical breakdown was good and it was pleasing that we got a number of respondents from what I would uh, regard as the less developed countries that one might have anticipated could struggle with the proposal we had that local bodies should be looking to refine our standards as part of the implementation process. Since the, uh, the, uh, our June meeting, we've actually gone to the next slide. Um, the IAASB um, has uh, had a session on PIES. Uh, we had a meeting with OSCO C1 representatives, primarily to discuss their views, given their strong preferences expressed in their response for what we termed the narrow approach, i.e. Uh, not the broad approach subject to refinement that we had gone for, uh, and a preference to retain the term listed entity. Um, and I will talk about their comments as I go through. Uh, we also had the joint, um, as uh, Sarah said, the joint IAASB IASB CAG session last week. Uh, the sense I got from that was that the CAG was generally supportive of what we were proposing to do including in particular the overarching objective, the broad approach, the publicly traded entity definition, uh, and indeed our proposal to remove um, two of the categories which were suggested in the ED, i.e. post-employment benefits, uh, and, and uh, also the um, uh, mutuals, and also the proposals regarding firms. Um, when we come on to it, we're also gonna discuss the, the necessity or otherwise of um, defining the term financial instrument. But again, I think the, I, the CAG was broadly satisfied. We did not need to seek to define that. Uh, but Galen, I don't know if there's any comments you wanted to add at this stage. Uh, thank you, Mike. No, I, I, I think you've characterized it. Uh, you know, th there were, were there were several people that spoke up that didn't go along with the rest of the crowd, but by and large, I think it, you know, there was support for what you had said. There wasn't much of a discussion about the firm's role and the, the change uh, from making it a requirement to encouragement. Perhaps that'll come up in this meeting. Thank you. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, so in what I was going to do with this, by the way, was go through, if you like, each of the questions that we had I'll pause to take comments on our proposals. I'll also um, ask Diane to put up the screenshot of what our current version of the draft looks like so that you've got the opportunity to comment on the wording as well as the general principles as we go through. Because I think the more we can try and narrow any areas of disagreement or points that people wish to make at this stage, the better. So as I say, I will take each sort of question in turn, but then pause to talk about what we've then reflected in the, uh, the draft. So in terms of the responses to our first question on the overarching objective, I think there is strong support for the proposed overarching objective. Uh, IOSCO in particular was fully supportive. A few suggested focus of public interest should be extended to non-financial information, but it was only a few. And certainly most people were comfortable that we had in fact, welcome that we had uh, clarified that it was in respect of, of uh, the financial side of it and therefore what the auditors were commenting on at this stage. Although I would hasten to add, uh, we've not taken any strong view at this stage on what might be uh, done if uh, the auditor's role is extended to more ESG reporting. Because I think until that is done, I wouldn't want to start to try and define what is a pie for that purpose of that reporting as opposed to financial statement reporting. I'd be putting the, uh, the cart before the horse, as we would say. 
Um, some respondents sought further clarification of the term financial condition and were concerned it was not defined. Um, and we'll come on to, I think, how we will, how I would see that uh, working out. Um, there was a question whether that term is different to financial statements and balance sheet. You will recall the board discussion we had when we came up with that term was it was trying not to narrow it so much to financial statements that it couldn't be taken to be slightly wider. But on the other hand, it was also accepted that the auditor's role is in respect of those financial statements. In that respect, some people did raise a concern about were we merely extending the expectation gap. Uh, again, I think the way we've tried to tackle that hopefully uh, will alleviate some of those concerns. Another key concern was regarding the reference to enhancing confidence in the audit financial statements, uh, as we'd expressed it in paragraph 400.9, and whether that could be perceived as implying different levels of independence and audit quality. Uh, and some suggested focus should be on the heightened expectations, the way we had expressed it in NAS and fees, which we have sought to reflect in the, the revised draft. If you can go on to the next slide. So again, there was, in terms of uh, the question aimed at the IAASB's constituents, there was broad support for a common overarching objective. And as it's reflected there, the IAASB agreed in their July meeting to look to try and agree on a common objective. There was some caution expressed again on this term financial condition. Uh, they did feel that they needed to develop a more tailored objective for the IAASB standards, which we have sought to accommodate in the way we have now split, if you like, 400.8 and 400.9, so that 400.8 would hopefully be something that could be used uh, by both boards and is common to both boards, uh, whereas 400.9 might be more tailored to the IAASB and the IESPA uh, issues uh, respectively. Um, as it says there, they still need to consider um, how a list of factors would be relevant to the IAASB and they may wish to tweak some of those factors depending upon how they are expressing uh, the detail um, and some concern that they shouldn't engage, they shouldn't have lots of differential requirements for lots of different entities because that just creates complexity and confusion. So if we go on to the next slide, so in response where the TF, where the task force is at, we are maintaining our preliminary review. Uh, we are retaining focus on financial condition of an entity. We have retained and clarified that term slightly. We've added due to the potential impact of their financial well-being on stakeholders, which was a expression we had used in the explanatory memorandum that accompanied the ED and some people liked doing that. Uh, and we have clarified that the rationale behind all of that is that financial statements can be used by stakeholders when assessing the financial condition of entities to try and address any expectation gap concerns. So in other words, linking it clearly back to the auditor's uh, work on the financial statements. We have removed the reference to enhancing confidence in the audit of those financial statements. And we have added in uh, the phrase about heightened expectations regarding independence of PI auditors. Go on to the next one. Uh, that sets out basically what we have uh, what we had uh, in the uh, ED. If you go on to the next slide, uh, I was going to ask whether you agree with our views, but before I go on and actually just throw the floor open, um, if we can go on to the next slide, which sets out the revisions that we have made. So at that point, I'd just like to pause for questions and observations on four, what is now 400.8 and 400.10. Bye. This is Hong Nam. Yep. Sorry, I need, let me just, let me get the participants up. Might be able to see who's putting hands up. There's no hands at the moment, but uh, Song Nam, you uh, participants, please raise your hands if you have comments. Yes, yeah, I'm comment. Yes, you. Oh, we Mike, okay. you're ready to take comments, or you? I'm ready to take comments. 
Okay, Sungnam. Okay, on uh, paragraph 408, this paragraph says, uh, states that some of the requirements and application material in this part are applicable to only the audit of the financial statements. But there is one new category of, category of entities to which the requirement and application material in this part are equally applied. This new category of entities consists of non-PI entities for which the firm applies PI independence requirements. So I'm of a view that this paragraph, fund 100.8, needs to cover both categories of, categories of entities to help the users of the code clearly understand. So currently, I believe it's a little bit, <laughs> there is a, a little bit uh, un uncomfortable to read. That's my comment. And sorry, let me just make sure I understand the point, because I think at one stage you said that re the requirements apply to non-PI entities. It could, yeah, non-PI entities for which the, the form decide to apply PI independence but requirements. The, 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 the point the is, that if, they are, if they are treating it, sorry, if they have decided it is appropriate to apply the PI independence requirements, then for all intents and purposes, it is a PI, because that is why they've decided to do it. But what's written in, in the paragraph 400, I believe, uh, 400.17A1, is a little bit different. It's not defined as a PI, but defined as non-PI for which PI independent requirements is applied. Okay. That's what's written, described. We, we, we could look at 400.17, because certainly the intention um, were, mm -hmm. from the task force was to say that if a firm had decided it was appropriate to, and I, I hesitate to use the term treat as a pie because we, we, we try to avoid that term because it has potentially wider implications than just independence. But let me say, if the firm has determined that it is appropriate that something is a pie for the purposes of this standard, then they should apply those requirements and say they have done so. It's not intended that they start applying PI independence requirements to things which, frankly, should not be should not be regarded by anybody as a PI. So, if we need to make a clarification anywhere, it would mm -hmm. be in four hundred seventeen, not here. But okay. that, that is that is a, a good point. So we will reflect on how we might need to reflect that. But I understand right. the point you're now making. Thank you. Thank you. Mike, can I take two more? Uh, uh, I, I see Caroline Lee and Hiro, Hiro Nori. Uh, Caroline? Thanks, Davros. Uh, Mike, I'm supportive of the changes proposed by the task force. I think uh, the split of 400.8 and 400.9 um, is helpful to the IWSB. Thank you. Hiro? Thank you, Stavros. Thank you, Mike, for your presentation. Um, overall, I'm supportive of the, of the proposed changes, but as for financial condition, I'm not sure the phrase added in paragraph 400.8 is useful for the purpose of clarifying the meaning of financial condition. It seems to me the term financial well-being just paraphrases the term financial condition. I mean, um, financial well-being is a synonym for financial condition. So I don't think this addition makes much sense to clarify the meaning of financial condition. So I'm, I'm wondering if it may be better to provide more detailed description of the term financial condition in basis for conclusion rather than adding the proposed phrase in the code. Thank you. Can I take one more mic or you want Yeah, sure, no, that's fine. Yeah. Vanya. Thank you, Stravis, and thank you, Mike, uh, for, for your presentation. Very, very interesting and very well done. Um, I'm pretty much supportive of the proposal that the tax force are, are, are presenting to us. 
I was just amazed that uh, some basic concepts like what is a financial instrument are still under discussion. And I, I, I find it particularly um, dangerous because if every standard setter is to propose a, a definition to, to different markets, it would end up that we will have no consistency at all among uh, different regulations. So um, uh, I think that it is very important what uh, the, the it's being trying to 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 be uh, reached right now in terms of having a sort of consensus in the definitions. And um, yeah, I, I think it is something that we should take in mind. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other raised hand. Cam, do you see any other? Or Mike? Other. Yep, no other raised hands. Thanks. Mike, back to you, Michael. Okay, uh, thanks for those comments. I mean, certainly it would be the intention to um, have some slightly more explanatory material in the basis of conclusions on what we mean by financial condition. Uh, and I take the point that it, it, it may be saying the same thing in slightly different words. Some people seem to like those different words. So I suppose where I'm at at the moment is, and we will reflect on it, I don't see the harm in it. And if we it put something in the basic conclusions as well, which was always the intention, I think it just helps reinforce, it just all helps reinforce what he, we mean by it, uh, term financial condition. In terms of financial instrument, um, I, I think I, I fully agree with you, Vanya, if I understood the point correctly. I mean, certainly we are not proposing to try and define that term financial instrument as uh, we'll come on to when we get on to that that stage. Okay. If there's no other comments, I was going to move on, Stavros. Yes, please move on. Okay, so we can go on to the next slide. So in terms of the second question, which was around the list of factors, again, respondents were generally supportive of the list. There was one or two refinement suggestions, nothing of which I would regard as, as very substantive. Um, there was some questions about whether the factors on their own uh, may not amount to significant public interest and should not be considered in isolation. There was some discussion about whether it was appropriate to relocate them, given that we talk about factors in other contexts further on. Uh, and question about revising the lead in to avoid any implication of a requirement. Some did suggest a few new factors, uh, geographical locations, sustainability, climate change, environmental exposures and risks, etc. But we felt that those uh, were moving away from the uh, financial condition that we were getting in at. So if we go on to the next slide, which is how we have dealt with that. Um, we are not proposing to revise anything in the list. As I say, I don't think there was, we felt that the list itself needed revision. We might provide some further explanation, additional guidance and or basis conclusions. Uh, we were guided heavily by Lisbeth as the uh, stru structure uh, guru on uh, everything to, by Esper that it wasn't necessary to clarify each factor in, in, that should not be considered in isolation. That was already the case in accordance with the drafting convention. Uh, we looked at the various suggestions for new factors, but didn't feel that we uh, wanted to include any of those. We have revised the lead-in sentence to try and make it more consistent with the rest of the code and indeed hopefully reduce the risk of factors being considered in isolation. And we have lastly moved the list of factors to a new paragraph 400.9 simply to separate it out from the 400.8. So as I say, if there are slightly different factors that the IAASB deem are appropriate for their, um, uh, st uh, their standards, then that, that links, and we've made a link clearer with the list for the firms in paragraph 400.17. So if we look at the, the what we've done to 400.9, if you go on to the next slide, uh, this is what we have now uh, amended. And if we can go on to the question and really just seek IESBA's views on that, and again, if you can flip to the next slide, which shows the changes that we've made to the ED in coming up that. And I will pause at that point again for any comments. Please raise your hands if you have any comments. Right, 
no raised hands at the moment, I see. In which case, I'll, I'll keep going while the going is good, if that's all right. So yeah. if we go on to the next slide. Um, so this is probably the, the, the start of the, what I regard as the somewhat more substantive uh, questions and issues. Um, clearly, the, in qu question three and seven around revising the definition, we were looking for support for our broad approach, what we termed a broad approach. I, I have to say these are shorthand, broad and narrow, um, to try and describe particular concepts. I wouldn't get too hung up on the words, but what we described as the broad approach, i.e. high level definitions that we fully wanted uh, local authorities to refine as they defined it for their particular jurisdictions or a narrow approach, which was baseline definitions that could just be incorporated um, without any refinement. There was more overall support for the broad approach, um, including response from the regulatory community. As I said earlier, developing jurisdictions were also generally supportive, which is good to see since it might have been anticipated they might have more difficulty in applying some of this. Where the respondents were very keen that we do what we said we would probably do, which is education and outreach, additional guidance and monitoring of the implementation of perhaps a post implementation review to see how this was incorporated, given it is a new way of working for IESBA. There was a significant proportion that preferred the narrow approach, uh, in particular IOSCO. A number of the firms, most of the firms probably on balance, preferred a narrow approach uh, and respondents from the EU. I think it is fair to say that um, when we uh, looked at it, whilst those who said they preferred the narrow approach were very clear in that view, they weren't very clear what they meant by an narrow approach or indeed how we might define things. So as we'll come on to in a minute, um, that was not something that we, uh, that we decided to take forward in the end. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, there was support for local bodies to refine the PI definition. There was a concern that people um, did not want local bodies necessarily to have the ability to just delete wholesale, um, but they certainly needed the ability to add in entities and refine it. There were comments about that were made about keeping the number of PIs in any jurisdiction uh, reasonable and manageable, and there is always a trade-off uh, on any of these things. Uh, there was one or two queries about how to deal with group situations, um, but I'm not sure that any of those are insurmountable. So again, if we go on to the next slide, um, our response to this is we have maintained our um, preliminary review on retaining the broad approach. We did have the discussion with IOSCO um, in the meeting we had with them in July they did acknowledge that we probably had a broader perspective on this than they might do given their focus on the listed entities and that having reflected on it, they didn't necessarily feel that there was a fatal flaw in what we were proposing. Um, we still believe that a narrow approach with baseline definitions cannot be practically achieved at a global uh, level if the definition is to be expanded, frankly, beyond listed entity. Um, the sorts of suggestions we had, a number of the EU respondents suggested that we adopted the EU definitions, but since those are all grounded in EU law and indeed vary from even within the different jurisdictions within the EU as to how local regulators have sought to implement some of that, particularly when it comes to carving out things like credit unions or mutuals, um, then uh, we felt that that was not a practical alternative. We acknowledge that this proposal may lead to some inconsistency, but on balance, we feel it should be helpful in ironing out inconsistency. That inconsistency exists today. Different jurisdictions have already come up with, in a number of cases, very different views on what they regard as public interest entities for the purposes of auditor independence requirements in their jurisdictions. The whole objective of the way we've approached this is by setting out an overarching objective and expanding the pie categories and giving some factors for people to consider, hopefully it would um, actually encourage a level of consistency when the local regulators seek to refine it. 
If anything, we think that removing um, post-employment benefits and uh, collective investment vehicles from the categories, um, both the extent and impact of inconsistency would, if anything, be reduced because those are probably the two which it is hardest for local bodies to actually get their arms around and potentially deal with. And lastly, we are still committed to the developing the necessary outreach programme as part of the rollout strategy. If we go on to the next slide, um, we have sought to address the concern that was expressed about excluding an entire category by actually explicitly removing that phrase. I don't think we can prevent local bodies removing an entire category if they deem that appropriate. I think that's less likely if we haven't got pension funds and, and uh, mutuals in there in the first place. And we have also made it very explicit local bodies can add although that was always, in our view, um, implicit in what was said anyway. We do acknowledge there are challenges in jurisdictions which have got existing robust legal definitions, and in particular those where the uh, PAOs are, do not necessarily play much of a role in actually setting the standards for independence, let alone who they apply to. Um, and obviously, as far as the group situation is concerned, we do believe that Generally speaking, that should be obvious in the sense of, yes, you may have multiple independent standards applying to a particular entity, either because that entity is in itself listed, for example, in different places. So um, my own company has to deal with both the UK independent standards uh, in term for its auditors and also the SEC uh, independent standards. That's a situation that exists today. I don't think we're adding any complexity to that. Uh, and in terms of what, applying independent standards to parts of groups, then clearly, again, that situation exists today where people have to apply the more rigorous of whatever independent standards is uh, relevant. So again, I'm going to pause for comments in terms of our recommendation to retain that broad approach and the revisions that we've got to 416A1 and A2. Um, which sort of sets out how we expect um, the, uh, the local bodies to deal with those uh, broad definitions. So again, if we can flip onto the next slide and just have that text in front of us as people comment. And sorry, I should say that we'll come on to um, the fact that we've decided to eliminate certain of the categories uh, a bit further down the presentation. if I can take any comments on, on these two bits. See a raised hand from Junpei. Junpei. <clears throat> Junpei, I think you might be on, on mute. Thank you, Tim. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <laughs> thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you very much for your hard work. Uh, I'd like to support task force proposal revisions. Uh, uh, systems of financial instruments, bank and insurance are working differently in countries. Uh, considering that it is very important for local bodies to refine pie definitions to be suitable to each country. I believe that uh, examples described in 400.16 would be very useful so that the local bodies uh, could have the definition in accordance with the ESBA code. Uh, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other comment at this point, please? See, Rich. Rich. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. And Mike, thanks for all your leadership on this. Um, my question, you may tell me it's, you're gonna cover it later. It really has to do with the definition of publicly traded. Are you? Do you have a section you're going to cover that in later, or is now the time to raise any questions on that? Uh, let, let's have it now. Okay. So the first question, as I understand it, um, we have a situation in the EU where the current EU definition of pie uh, relates to entities that are on a regulated exchange. And there are a number of markets that don't meet that definition. They're not regulated in various countries. 
Um, and in the question is, is if let's just say the EU reaches a determination that its current definition of pie, which is very similar to what you've had included here as it relates to depository institutions and, and insurance, um, to not change. As I, you, some have suggested that as you read this, that then entities on those unregulated exchanges would not be considered pies, even though they regularly trade the equity securities, particularly at the retail level. And is that addressed somehow? And I don't know if the task force gave consideration to that, because that seems like we are reducing the coverage of those entities as pies from where we have it today in the IESPA code. And then I have a, maybe I'll pause there, but I have a, a I guess my second question is understanding what is made by, meant by a publicly accessible market mechanism and the definition of publicly traded. Now pause there, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Mike, you want to take it now or can I have another? I have another. Okay, Brian, Brian Friedrich. Brian? Is that better? Yeah. Uh, thanks, and thanks, Mike, and the team for the work that's been put in here. I, uh, I really like the direction that the definition has gone, and I like the retention of the, of the broad, more flexible approach, uh, particularly around the ability to add in categories. I think that's, uh, that's helpful. The language looks good to me. Thanks. I don't see any other hands. Are there any other comments, please? Rich, you still have your hand raised. You have some more? No. Sorry. So back to you, Mike. Okay. And, and I will go on and talk a little bit more about publicly traded entities before I respond to your question, Rich. But I think um, I will try and respond to your question as I present it, if I can put it like that. Um, and obviously, if you've got any questions following that, then then let's uh, deal with that. So if we can go on to the, the next slide, which is about publicly traded entities. There was a substantial proportion of respondents that did like the term as a replacement. Um, some suggested more clarity and refinement um, and uh, particularly around the term of financial instruments and what was meant by publicly traded. Um, and as Rich just questioned, no doubt there will be those who will say, what do you mean by a um, publicly accessible sort of uh, market mechanism? Um, at the July meeting we had with IOSCO, they, the C1 members did think that financial instruments was helpful, but suggested we didn't develop our own definition. And I said I would come on to respond to that question that was asked earlier. We are not proposing to uh, come up with our own definition. Um, other comments and suggestions were listed entities should be considered to be considered as publicly traded under the new term. Uh, some did actually, and this, this sort of goes against what Rich was just suggesting, actually wanted to just align with the EU definition of regulated market. I'll give you three guesses where most of the respondents who were in favour of that came from. Um, and therefore, that would undoubtedly narrow it. Um, I also and a few others did want us to retain listed entity on the basis it was a well-used term or so we know it, it does run into problems occasionally as to what do you actually mean by that and the difference between that and regulated market etc um, and there was obviously strong encouragement for both the IAASB and IESBA to work closely together to ensure that whatever new term was uh, derived it, it was um, dealt with appropriately in each of the, the two standards. So if we go on to the next slide so, as I say, there were concerns about, as we uh, highlight in the ED, recognised stock exchange, whether it's the same as regulated market. We did intend that publicly traded market would scope in entities that are in second tier markets and over counter trading. Uh, I mentioned that uh, IOSCO had some preference for listed entity, um, but they also did conclude uh, at our meeting that if we incorporated it, suitably into our new term, then their concerns would probably be, which are focused on listed entities, that's what they exist to deal with, uh, would be largely addressed. Um, 
if we go on to the next slide, uh, in terms of the IAASB standards, we were asking about uh, how they would deal with this. There was overall support for what the IAASB had uh, posited as being a case-by-case -case approach to assess whether differential requirements should be applied more broadly to other pie categories. Um, the July 2021 discussion supported that case-by-case -case approach, um, and they thought that they would need to look at whether application material in some of their standards aligned with categories of entities in the PI definition. So they're discussing again our proposed definition of publicly traded entity and what that might mean for their standards uh, in October. So in terms of the response as to what the task force is now proposing, we are proposing to keep publicly traded entity. As I say, it had quite wide support generally. We have uh, replace that term publicly traded with trading through a public accessible market mechanism, which I know, uh, therefore, Richard said, well, can you define that? Um, and the answer is no, we're not proposing to define that. We believe, again, that should be something largely that local bodies uh, in effect define by saying what do they mean by the markets that they wish to capture as pies. And following on from Richard's earlier observation, then uh, clearly it would be open as it as uh, the e, a number of countries in the EU have already done to extend the legal definition in the EU beyond, beyond regulated market. So the UK, for example, does go beyond regulated market. Uh, equally, it would be for those jurisdictions to determine if they didn't want to extend it beyond regulated market. And you then kick into, well, what is the role of firms in that respect? And indeed, there are the, a number within the forum of firms at the moment that take a wider view of what is a pie in terms of what is publicly traded in the EU than just regulated market. Um, we don't, that doesn't change just because of this proposal. So in the same way as they do under the extant code, they could take that view under this code uh, proposal as well. Um, I don't think we can tell uh, a local regulator, for the reasons which will be obvious, which of their local markets they should be regarded as being captured as, as public interest entities. Some uh, local markets are deliberately set up with a reduced level of supervision, whether that's reduced level of supervision, reduced level of audit or anything else, in order to be more entrepreneurial and fast moving. I don't think it's up to us to say that they should put a level of control around it that the regulators don't believe is appropriate balancing that consideration. So I don't know if that totally answers your question, Rich, but clearly I don't think based on what we're doing today, we are changing the status quo. Um, I don't think that at the moment, at the moment it would be open, I think, to firms, certainly those outside the forum, to take the view that it's only regulated markets in the EU which hit that definition of listed. Because again, listed tends to be a slightly um, not well-defined term, if I can put it like that. And that was part of the problem we had with what is a listed entity and does it equate to regulated markets, etc. cetera. Um, financial instruments, as I'd already indicated, um, it's in, interesting enough, it's mentioned in the NAS final text without any definition. Um, we did look at whether the IS32 definition might be suitable for sort of use within the code, but um, slightly regrettably, um, the IS32 definition of a financial instrument, I think, is something along the lines of a, of a contract which evidences a financial asset or financial liability. Uh, and it then goes on for another page and a half to explain what it means by financial asset or financial liability or equity. Um, and therefore, incorporating that would be somewhat cumbersome. We did think about cross-referencing, but we didn't really like that either. And on balance, again, because we would expect local um, regulators, by defining, if you like, the sorts of markets they were capturing, would, by definition, because they would be um, restricting themselves to the instruments traded on those markets, they would have their own definition, effectively, of what they meant by financial instrument in that context. But I would be interested in the board's views on, on, on that. Um, but that's where we, the task force stands today. If we go on to the next 
one in terms of dealing with IOSCO's views on list identity, we have um, sought to uh, meet their requirements by, as I say, adding, adding in the phrases that we've got and also quoting an example um, as what would be a publicly traded entity, both of which I think uh, go a long way to meet their desire to keep the term listed entity. So if we go on to the definition of publicly traded entity, this is what we are now proposing. Uh, and I would ask again for task force's views on whether they're comfortable that we don't seek to define the term financial instrument. Uh, if people do think we need to define it, I would be very grateful to receive uh, suggestions on how we should define it rather than just a general exhortation to define it. Um, and similarly, uh, I would be interested in task force views as to how we have dealt with listed entity. Sorry, Josephine. Sorry, apologies. Okay, sorry. <laughs> that was obviously not aimed in my direction. Uh, <laughs> so at that point, I was going to propose to pause for questions and you can flip up, if you flip up the next slide, then that's got the um, revised definition of publicly traded entity that we're proposing to use. Okay, are you open for discussion now? Uh, yep, I see Rich lost no time getting his hand up. Yeah. Yeah, no, I appreciate your response, Mike. I, I guess <clears throat> the, the, I, I believe today that the reason entities on these unregulated exchanges are still treated by listed entities is in fact by the, because of the explicit row words in the ISBA code. And so then I'm cognizant of the fact that this phrase uh, publicly available market mechanism, uh, it would seem to me that even if the EU doesn't or other jurisdictions don't recognize unregulated markets, when you actually have an exchange with listing standards and rules and a means by which people exchange debt, I would think, or I'm sorry, exchange equity, I would think you therefore have a publicly available market mechanism. Uh, and, and I don't know whether that might be something that should be clear. If we're not going to address that more specifically here, I, I would suggest that that should be in the basis for conclusion. Um, I do have a second question on this, though. In many, as I understand it, in many jurisdictions of the world, entities that are private or even entities that have no equity ownership, uh, equity outstanding, like certain types of not-for-profits, perhaps in the healthcare field, uh, often issue debt many times um, that are issued under various governmental regulations that allow them to be considered tax-free. And it is less clear when we get to this concept of a definition or a, a, a uh, I'm sorry, the publicly accessible market mechanism that that whether those entities are going to be scoped in on the basis that it is possible for two parties or a party to perhaps find a broker or find the entity and buy their debt uh, because it's an advantageous in investment, particularly institutional investors uh, like financial institutions. And I'm trying to figure out, are we going to, are we suggesting that all of those entities, and this, this could be an extraordinary large number, are now public, uh, public interest entities by virtue of the fact that there's a way somebody can buy their debt, even though it may not be a recognized or unrecognized exchange. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there. And, and again, I'm just trying to understand because I think it's, it's not very clear from feedback I've been hearing and trying to wade through. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Any I mean, if I just, well, so I'd respond to that one quickly, Sarah, because it was fairly specific and it may, I mean, we came up with the phrase public accessible market mechanism to, to try and get away, Rich, from the situation you just outlined, which is you can do some bilateral trading, albeit potentially through a broker who helps facilitate it. This was designed to be something more than that. Um, certainly, I think in the basis of conclusions, we can explain the thinking more. I think it's quite hard to start trying to work it into a definition. 
Um, but again, I would hope um, that um, in a number of jurisdictions, if not absolutely every single one, local regulators would take the opportunity of very clearly explaining which of the, quotes, markets in their jurisdiction they regarded as being uh, something which fell within this, that things that were traded on it should be treated as pies. Okay. Uh, I see Galen has raised a hand. Yeah. Um, to follow up with Rich and, and uh, Michael's discussion here, or, or where I, I'm just sort of wondering where municipal, municipal securities fit into this. Uh, we would call it state or provincial. Uh, and, and for the reasons that Rich mentioned for tax advantages and so forth, they are traded and not, but not necessarily on an exchange. Uh, they're exempt, or, or there might be what what is called exempt offerings. And I, and I think, I think the task force has addressed this in the past, Michael. But uh, it, it might be helpful to clarify that in the basis of conclusions. Thanks. I mean, it's, it's obviously difficult again because the the market mechanisms um, are extensive. We, I'm certainly happy. Um, Rich, outside this meeting to understand exactly what the mechanism um, that is used for trading munis. Um, as I say, if it, if it relies on uh, the, the person who wishes to either buy or sell the securities to go out and almost seek on a bilateral, albeit with potentially broker assistance, somebody who can buy that same set of munis, then this is not really what this is designed to capture. Um, it's designed to capture those things where, if you like, there is a it's it's freely traded because there is a market. <laughs> um, and if there is a market, then I would argue that even potentially munis ought to be caught if there really is a, a marketplace that exists uh, for trading those entities, even if it's debt as well. But Rich, I'm, I'm very happy to have a discussion outside the, the meeting, which, if you like, if you um, can explain exactly what the situation is in the US, I'm very happy to try and ensure that through the base of the conclusion language, we, we deal with it appropriately, if I can put it like that. Thank you, Mike. Um, I don't see any other hands. I was just wondering whether our IWSB colleagues uh, would like to make a comment at this point, since we've been talking about the definition of including listed entity in the definition, if they do. Thank you, Stavros, it's Josephine. Nothing additional to add here. Okay. Thank the you. border, the IWSB will be discussing uh, the proposals at the October meeting. Okay, uh, let me make a remark on, on that. I was wondering whether um, the word example in the definition that you are showing on the screen, listed entity as defined by relevant security is an example. I wonder whether instead of example, we could say category. Uh, because I, I think we're using extant code um, convention in terms of those in the glossary, those italics are all examples. No more, no less than that, frankly, Stavros. Okay, I just think- And, that and, we, and we, ha we have got the phrase above, of course. So if you like, it's in, two, it's in twice. Well, I simply think that category is a more uh, solid and robust term. It's not just an example, but uh, I'll-, I'll I'll think a little more about that. I understand okay. where you're coming from. Yeah. As I say, we, we were just following convention that if it appears in italics as we've got it here, rather than as part of the definition per se, uh, and that's how we tried to deal with it, then it dealt with as an example. That's the, All right. that's okay. the convention. Well, far from me to 
wanted to violate the convention to the restructured code, of course. I, I was going to say, this is why we had Elizabeth on the task force. There's no way we're going to do that. Okay, uh, I see two more. Uh, Hans, Yao Shu. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you, Max. And uh, I'm wondering, uh, I, I, I didn't know whether the tax force have ever uh, uh, considered that for the entities who uh, issue the bonds, uh, that you know that the bond has a maturity date and may not be as uh, sustainable as this is the company from the perspective of price status. Uh, it is uh, suggested to consider how to deal with the entity status from the whole process of bond issuance. That you know, sometimes maybe that's the the bonds can be matured at some time, and uh, so not uh, like the listed uh, entities. That's uh, maybe this entity sometimes uh, is a pie, but uh, when the bonds uh, matured, and maybe the that the status will change. I I just wondered uh, whether you have ever think uh, of such a such kind of things. Thank you. Mike, I have one more. Do you want to take uh, one more? Yep. Uh, I see Lisbeth. Lisbeth, please. Uh, having been called the guru of structure at the beginning of the meeting, I just want to react to what has been said on the italics. So actually, there's nothing against uh, going for Stavros. Uh, okay. suggestion. It is an italics are just used for explanations of the scribe terms uh, which have a specific meaning in the code. So we could say it's could a I say of, yeah. Thank you. I, I remain corrected as always <laughs> when it comes to structure. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, Mike, you want to make a comment on Yao Shu's remark? Uh, yeah, I suppose I don't see anything different to the extant code with listed entities. I mean, it captures bonds today. Things can flip in and out of being listed. Um, so I, I do think there's not a big distinction there. I don't think you're going to capture a lot of entities that issue financial instrument, issue debt that is traded actively in a, through a market mechanism that are going to do it one day and then stop the next. Um, but you know, if they do, then they do. They change. They change uh, the criteria. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other remarks at this point, Mike. Uh, okay. If we go on then. So in terms yeah. of looking at the the other categories. Um, says this, that regulators, NSS, PAO is more supportive of all the categories. Uh, strongest support for A, B and C, which you'll recall is basically um, shorthand banks and insurers, as well as uh, our redefined publicly traded entity. Less support for the other categories, which were post-employment benefits and mutuals, um, particularly from the firms and EU respondents who needs to say don't include that today. Um, a concern that if a local body doesn't refine the definition, it could scope in quite a lot of uh, very small entities which nobody would objectively regard as PIEs uh, in those categories D and E. Um, the firms that were supportive of the narrow approach were supportive of added categories, particularly B and C, less so for D and E. Um, there was very little support for adding in new categories. And you recall this is a question we asked about ICOs and other less conventional forms. And there were one or two um, suggestions for additional categories, but none of them uh, that we felt that we needed to take on board. So if we go on to the next slide, which is the task force responses and proposals, we propose to retain BNC in the life support received. Uh, we propose to remove D and E um, for the reasons that we went through at the board in June, that they would potentially scope in significantly more entities that are very small. We do feel that um, 
if we remove those categories, it will minimise any potential unintended consequences if local jurisdictions don't properly refine the code uh, and also reduce the risk of them removing entire categories. Um, the most comprehensive view of PIES, which is probably still the EU audit directive in terms of its sweeping uh, range, did not include post-employment benefits and mutual funds, although one or two of the countries where those are particularly important, in particular, um, the post-employment benefits have included them. So the UK, for example, has got some of the larger pension funds effectively included. And we're not proposing to add any new categories to the, the proposed definition. If we go on to the next slide, um, and I'll ask Robert to, to add his comments in a minute, but you will have seen from the PIB's public interest issues, that the PIB has a real concern about removing post-employment benefits and CIV on the basis it's not consistent with how we've defined uh, the qualitative, well, they say characteristics, but the factors that we feel should be taken into account uh, of what is a pie. Um, they say even when small in size, it can generate significant interest given the fiduciary responsibilities, uh, that it can have a significant systemic impact in the economy. Um, and those are factors which are included in our proposed, what was then paragraph 400.8 and now 400.9. Um, and in addition, it does remain important to consider the expected role of local regulatory bodies in further refining the definition. Um, in terms of our view on, on that, it, we do not see that we are necessarily um, persuaded that we should add them in. Um, and on the basis that we do believe it is best left to the local bodies to add that in. So our rationale in terms of excluding um, D and E, if I can just flip to the next slide, when we've sat back and, and reflected on the PIOB's comments, we do feel this is an untried an untested model um, and actually removing those reduces the risks of that untried and untested model not uh, succeeding. We do acknowledge that in a number of countries, um, there are significant challenges where the PAOs, as I said before, have limited or no role in setting independent standards because they're either set by legislation or non-accounting regulators um, as to what independent standards should apply to various entities. And a number of those category, countries have already included categories B and C in their local requirements, but not necessarily D and E. The structure type size of both post-employment post retirement benefit schemes, so whether it's defined benefit, whether it's defined contribution, whether it is um, medical insurance, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and indeed CIVs, which arguably capture hedge funds and various other things, they do very considerably. Some of them can be very small and where we would argue the public interest may well not be significant. I'm chairman of uh, pension trustees of a pension fund for the local prep school where my kids went to school. It has less than 100 members and, and uh, only about £2 million in assets. I would argue it is not of significant public interest. Um, if the broad definitions are not appropriately refined, then the impact, as far as the forum of firms is concerned, who are the only people uh, you will recall who actually uh, agree to follow our standards as they are written, um, it would lead them to scope in potentially large number of entities, which I don't think objectively would be classified as pies, and that will present practical issues and problems. Um, we do think there's a number of jurisdictions where at least some post-employment benefit schemes or sort of significant public interest, they've effectively included such entities in their pie definition. Some SIVs, for example, are in fact also, quote, listed entities, even though the main trading mechanism is to sell back to the company, not to trade them. Um, so all in all, we think the proposal does strike an appropriate balance in the overall public interest. We are not seeking to ignore the public interest aspect of this, but uh, clearly this is, as I say, an area which is of concern to the PIOB. So before passing over to the board, uh, I just want to know whether Robert would like to comment. Yeah, yes, thank you, Mike. And I would like to comment on this. Um, um, I, it, it's, a, it's a great analysis. There are very uh, um, different, uh, uh, difficult judgments involved here. And you've referred to balancing um, characteristics. 
Um, but uh, this this is a, a, a significant issue for for the POB. Um, uh, the the acknowledgement that the category in itself uh, does have public interest benefits really puts you at the starting point in terms of of, of principled standard setting that you should include them, um, and uh, rather than um, taking an approach of um, the, the specific concerns, for example, around size, um, driving the general proposition. Um, and there's a, there's a big risk in that in terms of, of method, um, because it, it, it can drive you down to a sort of lowest common denominator approach. Um, you, you're right to, to be pointing to the risks around what local bodies might or might not do uh, and their capability and the newness of this. Um, but it is a bit surprising, I think, um, given what the task force has been said, saying previously about the, the overall model of this, which does include, and I think you might have said it at the last meeting, Mike, uh, the local bodies and indeed the firms being part of the package. So if you take that as the approach, uh, then um, uh, while it, it's very commendable to see an attempt to be responsive to the public interest by, by striking that balance, um, uh, there's quite a bit of um, subjectivity and speculation involved, can I, can I observe, in relation to some of the points that are being made there um, about what might happen. Um, and uh, there are, of course, other options to deal with that, not only by writing um, exceptions into the standard, so you have the general qualified by the specific, um, but you have options as well, which is monitoring implementation. There's the opportunity to do that through the, the relationship with national standard setters, an early post-implementation review, um, and I don't see those sort of factor, th those sorts of issues being factored at all into the analysis, um, uh, particularly in, in the key paragraph in your paper is, is para 147, and that doesn't seem to mention that. Um, uh, it, it, it's quite a lot, a lot of it appears to be quite um, quite subjective to me, um, and uh, while acknowledging that. Um, uh, there are many pension funds and mutual funds which, which would be of a size that would make them likely to attract significant public interest in the financial conditions. So uh, I hope it's helpful just to signal that at the outset and that uh, look, look forward to having a, a robust debate about it. But, uh, but just to, to, to reiterate that the, 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 this is a significant issue for us and we, we're um, keen to, to see how the discussion proceeds. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. So at that point, I would like to flip over to the next slide and then the, ne the next slide thereafter um, on the basis of uh, what our current proposals are. You can see that they're fairly simple in terms of uh, what we've done to 400 point, uh, what is now 400.15. Um, and you've heard Robert, so I'd be interested in the board's views. It's all day uh, and I would like to open the floor for that now. Mike, this is, this is what we're seeing is what you're proposing. Correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. Well, uh, comments from the floor, please. I think given um, I don't see any hands. Given, given the significance of this and given the PIOB's very explicit position that we should uh, not uh, uh, delist those take those categories out, D and E, it would be very important at this point for the board to take a view. And I would like to urge all of you to take a view uh, on this, please. Uh, I do see a hand from Rich Haskin. Rich? Yes, thank you. Um, and, and Mike, uh, I thought the 
rationale uh, was quite understandable. I, I might even add, as it relates to the uh, exclusion on E, I believe in many jurisdictions around the world, actual mutual funds are in fact going to be considered either because they are listed in some way on an exchange or there is a market mechanism for trading them. And what that would leave out are things that truly involve um, private uh, individuals, usually qualified investors who have signed up for an instrument that is not actually exchangeable by them. And they may not sell, transfer, exchange it um, uh, over the life of the fund. Um, uh, and, and, and that's particularly what we all think about as private equity and many of the hedge funds and even the hedge funds that allow uh, for some exchange, it's often on a delayed liquidity basis. There are gates that can be put down to prevent liquidation. And those investors um, are, are clearly uh, not um, the broad public, if you think of it that way. So I, I just add that to your list of arguments. And on the pension issue, I think the concern is that the the breadth of the number of entities and their sponsors that would be made pies by this does not make sense uh, broadly. And I also support the, the change you made. I could make some other arguments on that, but I'll pause and let others step in. Thank you, Rich. Other views, please. Mr. Chairman, I think Sanjeev. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Devos. Uh, I think uh, Mike, you made a point on B and C. Uh, obviously, there is no issue, and uh, the feedback is it should remain as it is. Uh, on D and E, I think the point which is being made is that if it is untried and untested, uh, I think as long as the global regulators have the powers to make changes to the definition of pi, uh, even if it is covered in our uh, in our uh, extent code or the revised code, I would I would like to go ahead with including DNE and not deleting them uh, because when we started with the definition of pi uh, last year, or this year, I think the idea was to expand the definition in such a way that there is an example before the regulators all over the world to see what is likely to be considered by them. And then they, they are at the point to include, expand, or, or reduce the scope, depending on their local jurisdiction. So as long as the local jurisdictions have either to adapt the code or make it make changes to it while adapting it, uh, I, I see a big challenge in uh, keeping b &E intact. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, Mike, can I go on? I see Caroline Lee. Caroline. Thanks, Devros. Um, Mike, I'm supportive of uh, the deletion of D and E. Uh, my my comment is more to do with has more to do with four hundred point fifteen A one in the last sentence where we are saying that uh, the designation might mean that such entities are not pies for purposes of the code. It, um, so that sounds a bit um, convoluted. And I was wondering whether we can go back to the original wording, which to me was a bit clearer or um, if not, I can try and suggest um, some alternative wording for the task force to, to consider. That's all, thank you. Caroline. Happy, happy to take wording on that one, Caroline. I, I might put you in a room with Elizabeth though, because I, I'm not suspicious feeling we changed it because suggestions she was making, but I may have that wrong. Okay, thanks. Caroline, do you have a view on the inclusion or deletion of categories D and E? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with the deletion, Zavros. Okay. 
I just wanted to hear that. Thank you very much. Jens, Jens Paul. Thank you, Stavros, and thank you, Michael, for this uh, very good presentation. I agree with the deletion because I have understood the inclusion in the exposure draft as an activity to understand how broadly this definition of pies is globally accepted. And with no surprise, A, B, and C have an overall, more or less overall global uh, acceptance, but we have now heard from many jurisdictions and very different stakeholders that D and E is not at that level. And that's why I would prefer the deletion and the option for those jurisdictions who think that it is has to be part of the pie definition to opt in this. So that's my observation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um... I see Ian, Ian McPhee, Ian. Uh, thanks, Devros. Uh, yes, I support the uh, deletion. I think the deletion will de-risk the implementation, but as Jens has said, will still allow jurisdictions to opt in D and D, D and E if they wish. So I think it works very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see Hero. Thank you, Stavros. Uh, thank you, Mike, uh, for your presentation. Um, I'm supportive of the task force view to delete D and E. And also, I like the idea of adding these entities uh, in paragraph 416A2 for local bodies consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Hiro. Sadia. Thank you, Stavros. Um, it's easy to see why A, B, and C way were kept in and D and E have been taken out because it's missing the to the public or from the public language that allows for some criteria on the size on the nature of the entity. Um, I understand why the task group have moved in the direction of deletion. And my question would be, uh, would be on, has any thought been given on the type of wording we would be including when we issue guidance to local uh, bodies and national standard setters on categorizing what type of entity should be considered first um, and, why, and what kind of questions should be asked um, as they include those. So really giving a push to to have them included at local bodies and support for how it can be included. Thank you. Thank you, Sadia. Uh, Sungna. You are on mute, Sungna. Yeah, I changed the mute. Okay, yeah. I concur with the task force's, this task force's proposal to take the two down. So I agree to exclude D and E. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I see Yashu. Yashu. Uh, thank you, Stavros. Uh, I support the deletion of D and E. I think it's a good option for the national standard setters or the regulators to uh, decide whether to add or Oh, the D and E, but it's the option of the national standard setters. Thank you. Thank you. Laura, Laurie. Um, yeah, very quickly, I think for the reasons articulated by others, I also support the deletion of those and agree that it's a good opportunity for national standard setters um, to actively be thinking about where they want to include uplifts. And as Saidia mentioned, I think it's important in terms of communication and or guidance, the types of things that they may want to be thinking about or considering. Um, but I think beyond that, I would leave it out. Thank you, uh, Laurie. Brian. Thanks, I think very, similar to the comments that have been made, especially what uh, Laurie and Sadia also indicated, 
Although, I, although I'm a bit uncomfortable, I'll say, though, with the deletion, I think there are mitigating methods of dealing with these two issues to nonetheless encourage them uh, as categories for NSSs to consider, particularly with some additional clarifying language, because I, I do understand that D&E um, pose a pretty significant risk of bringing in uh, too many small entities. But I think by entirely missing the, the larger entities that probably ought to be drawn in, I think that's, that's more where the issue is. But that can be done through other mechanisms. So I'm, I'm supportive of the direction. Thank you, Brian. And may I recognize Lisbeth? Thank you, Stavros. Yeah, uh, being on the task force, of course, I, I support this uh, proposal of deleting d &E and actually raised my hand after Sadia uh, spoke up. So uh, I, I have expressed that in the task force discussions as well, that I do believe it's not just a matter of deleting it, but that in the guidance to the local bodies, we should really uh, help them think about other entities that could be of public interest within their jurisdiction that are not expressly named here. And these two could, for instance, be uh, examples with some further facts and circumstances as to why these could potentially be applied within their jurisdiction. So I just wanted to emphasize that I actually call that a hybrid approach to what we initially proposed in the ED. Thank you. Thank you, Lisbeth. Is there any other board member who has not taken a position um, out there? I assume the task force members uh, are behind this proposal. So I would like to say my opinion too. Um, and I would like to start by saying that, you know, I have been a capital market regulator in the EU back in the early 2000s. And I'm fully aware of the public interest significance of uh, collective investment vehicles and pension funds. Uh, however, I do remember from that experience and since then that these are areas where market evolution uh, and economy evolution has led to a great variety of legal form, management form, and uh, scope. So this is not an easy area. This is not an area, in no way is it an area as standardized, if you will, as banks or insurance companies. We're talking about something that has a lot of variety, both within jurisdictions, but also across jurisdictions. Uh, I was thinking, for example, that uh, pension funds uh, in several countries in the EU, uh, the preponderance of them is public sector pension funds. Uh, you have public and private, and um, some of the private under insurance companies and so forth. There is such a great variety that, to my mind, and having been a regulator, I think that it would be an inordinate burden for regulators if this were a mandatory category uh, to try to sort out uh, what is in and what is out. It's not a simple task. And I think we have to take that into account. And therefore, uh, I agree that they do not have the same public interest and the same uh, uh, ease of handling uh, standing as banks and insurance companies. There are categories of capital market uh, forms. There are many different capital market forms, of course. Uh, and by the way, the task force has considered and excluded items like equity funds or uh, other capital market issues, which could be in those categories. So I really think that uh, since exclusion does not really mean that we exclude them for good, but it simply means that we relegate them to the space where national standard setters and national regulators will have to do something about it. I think this is eminently reasonable given the situation of the markets in the world. And uh, I really believe that we should, instead of making it a mandatory category and running the risk of regulators not acting enough or not acting in a timely fashion uh, about this, 
and therefore risking you know, having everything accepted as pie, uh, I would rather we make a conscious decision that this is an area where we should let what this standard is trying to do anyway, let national standard setters and national regulators in an evolutionary way and their own means and depending on their own circumstances, uh, resolve this issue. I agree with the proposals that several colleagues have made that we may bring out these two categories, which by the way, are included in, in 400.9. The first two bullets of factors that we uh, talk to national regulators about are clearly inclusive of these two categories. And uh, so I would agree that maybe we could introduce some application material, uh, guidance about the significance of these two categories without making it mandatory on the same standing as banks and insurance companies. By the way, having banks and insurance companies, I'm, and I'm speaking remembering history, it has been uh, a request from um, the Basel Committee and the Insurance Supervisors for quite some time. And one of the benefits of these two categories, which CIVs and pension funds do not have, is that these two categories, banks and insurance companies, have dedicated regulators. So there's a lot of difference. And uh, therefore, I too agree uh, that the exclusion is the more wise course. The exclusion from uh, does not mean that it will be excluded forever. And I'm a believer very much of post-implementation reviews, you know that, uh, which will guide us on this in future, but that's my position. If there is anyone else who would like to speak at this point and has not, please raise your hand. Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and not to, uh, not to steer uh, your thunder, I think uh, the words you've spoken are, are wise words. I just wanted to speak to the, uh, to the point about global operability of the code, uh, because the board, the board's responsibility is to promote standards that are globally applicable. And we know of one a G20 jurisdiction, uh, France uh, is, is the case in point, uh, in which the broad approach with inclusion of categories DNA would not work. Because in France, the relevant body that has responsibility to promulgate uh, relevant ethical requirements is, uh, is the government, the French government, through the Ministries of Justice and Finance. And uh, France doesn't adopt our code. So it, it, it would be almost, um, uh, it would almost go against the grain of global standards to promulgate an approach that would not operate in one jurisdiction and particularly a, a member of the G20. So that is an important consideration that we have to have regard to. And the, the, uh, the, uh, the way you've uh, suggested, Mr. Chairman, which is to allow local jurisdictions to uh, consider their national context, uh, consider the, the relevant factors, uh, and make the decisions as, as to uh, the best approach uh, for, their, for their circumstances, uh, depending, depending on the facts and circumstances, is, is, uh, uh, is a reasoned way to go. Uh, it is a balanced way to go, and it would not result in an outcome that would pose the code to, uh, to not be globally applicable. And, and what I'm speaking to is not about trying to come up with an exception because an exception can, uh, can live within a set of globally operable uh, standards because it would, it would apply in every jurisdiction except that it would be with the particular act pattern. But here we're talking about standards uh, uh, as to whether they can be portable and adopted in, in every jurisdiction around the world. So, so that, that approach that the council has proposed would, would enable those standards to remain globally affordable. Thank you. Again. I see Robert has got his hand up. I mean, perhaps before we go back to, to Robert, um, 
Stavros, two things. Um, one, I, I don't know whether it's worth Galen commenting from a CAG perspective, and then I was going to add a couple of comments, and then perhaps we could ask Robert for his his views. That's fine, yes. Uh, so let me turn to Galen. I was going to ask him, in fact. Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you, Mike and Stavros. So the, the CAG as a whole, the support, it, I, we, we didn't have significant uh, objection to the deletion. In hearing the, this discussion, I think, you know, maybe even more than guidance uh, application material might be helpful to it to address this situation. Unfortunately, I'm most familiar with uh, this in my home country, and there's significant uh, on post-employment benefits, uh, significant reporting written into law uh, that's evident there. But there's literally thousands and thousands of uh, of these plans that are reported upon with financial statements. I I don't know what the situation is with a, a, a lot of the rest of the world. Uh, I do agree with Rich's earlier comment that uh, uh, many of the collective uh, investment vehicles, the CIVs, uh, are, are publicly held, including in the U.S., uh, and therefore scoped in. So I, you know, I I, I think it's a a, a very legitimate uh, uh, issue that the uh, PIOB has raised. I don't think that the CAG uh, objects to the to the, uh, the, the uh, uh, direction of travel that the board is taking on this, but perhaps it could be uh, expanded somewhat to accommodate those concerns that they have uh, put on the table. Thank you. Thank you, Galen. Uh, Are you happy? I just add, add a couple of comments before turning back to Robert. Are you let, me, let, me, let me make sure nobody else from the members wants yeah. to take more. Cam, do you see anyone? No. Nobody else. Okay, Mike, please. Yeah, I mean, from a personal perspective, I've always viewed this project um, and the way we've approached it as leading the witness, if I can put it like that, in terms of trying to guide local bodies into coming up with a sensible pie definition for their jurisdiction. And to me, it's a distinction between how hard you lead that witness so with categories A, B and C, as we're proposing them, we're leading the witness quite hard because we're saying it's all in unless you take anything out. With D and E, I certainly agree that we could put in application material and possibly not even restricted to D and E, which encouraged local bodies quite hard to look at other categories to think about where they include them. But I do think that as I said at the outset, this is an untried model in terms of going down this road uh, of relying so much on local implementation that I would be reluctant to throw the baby out with the bathwater and put in something that we felt was going to create significant practical difficulties on the ground. I agree with you, Staff Ross, that I think, and I think even Robert, you indicated post-implementation review. I think post-implementation review of this standard is going to be very important but I'd sooner it was a post-implementation review which managed to say that what we had done so far was successful and we might look to add, rather than, oh dear, it was a complete disaster and we now need to rethink. But that's were my only observations at this stage. Thank you, Mike. Can I turn to you, Robert? Yes, that, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for the, for the, the debate. It's uh, good to, um, to have the expression of views and there's a, there's a very clear um, uh, sense of what the, where the board wants to go on this. Uh, as I said, it is clearly a, um, a judgment call and, and I was actually, and one of the things I, I was th thinking of saying, Stavros, was that you know, the outcome is the same, which way, whichever way you would hope the outcome is going to be the same, whichever way you go. Um, so, uh, really, just in closing, there, there's there's um, some uh, good points um, which uh, the PIOB can reflect on um, and, um, and 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 consider. And I think that uh, the way of of um, us working together forwards on this in the spirit of collaboration um, is um, is to to put the, um, the work into that application material that, that you're talking about, Mike, 
um, and there's an opportunity in December to come back in December with that, um, and uh, and and also those other mechanisms, um, uh, in, including uh, the post implementation review, but also the the plan um, to to work with um, uh, with the national standard setters group. Uh, and as you know, I, I I am a national standard setter as well as being a POB member. I also come from a jurisdiction, New Zealand, which which has. Um, a very broad definition of a pie um, uh, under our, our local um, um, regulations, um, and uh, so certainly understand all of all of those dynamics. Um, so um, let's reflect on it, um, and um, as I say, it will be really helpful to see what um, the task force uh, can 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 come up with in, in December in relation to. Um, Padding out the the, the 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 package that you're now um, uh, wanting to proceed with. So thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Robert and Mike. Uh, it's past the time for our break, so uh, I would like, if you don't mind, stopping now. I, I would welcome a break. <laughs> of course, I think we all would, since this was quite uh, an intense part of the of the discussion. So uh, I would like to go uh, on a break for 15 minutes. So Ken, we should be back. Can you say it in Eastern time, please? Um, so that I don't confuse it. We should be back uh, 10 minutes after the hour, whatever the hour is. Yeah, so that's 11.10 uh, a.m. Eastern. Okay, all right. Okay, Thanks. thank you for Thanks. break, break. Mike, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, we are running behind schedule. So uh, you have any, any idea how long? I think we're in the home straight, Stavros. We've okay. dealt with all the difficult issues, frankly. All right. We have uh, the rollout. I mean, the, of the official timing was um, 5.15 my time, so just over an hour, is that right? Well, don't don't ask me about the hour because I'm in a different time zone. But the official time is that uh, we would start NAS and fees rollout at 11:45 Eastern time, okay. which is now what time is it now? 11:10. It's 11:10 now. Yeah. We just have about 35 minutes. Mike. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, All I'm right. sure we can. Do it justice in that time. Okay. Okay. So we can begin um, and go back to you, Mike. Um, 
to, to, to continue from where you were. Okay. Whoever is operating the slides could get us to the right point. Okay. So the, the next two um, questions were around the role of firms, which you'll recall we had elevated or proposed to elevate the application material encouraging firms to determine if additional entities should be treated as pies um, to a requirement. Um, and we also looked for transparency about what entities had been treated as pies. In terms of the responses then, most regulators, um, national standard setters, et cetera, were supportive. Most firms were not. PAOs were kind of split in their views in terms of the answer to the first question. The reasons given for not supporting the pros requirement included the fact that the firm's determination would be subjective. It will create more divergence inconsistencies. Um, the responsibility to classify entities as pies should be primarily that of IESBA and local bodies. Um, some felt that those charged with governance and not the firms should determine if the entity should be subject to additional pie requirements. And there was a concern that firms will bear a disproportionate responsibility and burden, particularly as regards SMPs. Um, there were other comments about the relevance of the RITP test and the proposed requirement, although, of course, that underlies all of our um, requirements where there is judgment concerned. A uh, concern about practical difficulties if management, and those, excuse me a minute, I'm just going to remove the dog. <laughs> oh, that. about that distraction. Um, and practical difficulties to management, those charges of government didn't agree, and um, concern again about the differential standards and, and the gold standard. Going on to the transparency, if you can click on to the next slide, the response pattern was pretty similar. Again, concerns about confusion about the meaning of the disclosure. Has the firm also complied with other non-independence requirements of treating its pie? Uh, concern about misconception and different levels of independence and non-pie audits of lower quality. Um, other comments, what matters to stakeholders whether the auditor's independence required by relevant ethical requirements. Taking all of those into account, then the task force pro uh, current proposal, uh, if you go on to the next slide, um, it basically as, as follows, you go on to the next one. So having reflected on it, um, we felt it would be appropriate to revert the proposed firm requirement back to application material and make it much more explicit about determining if the independence requirements for PI should be applied. So slightly different to the extant application material. So we try to get away from using the language of treat as a PI. We do believe that, and partly it's a quid pro quo for this, it is appropriate to retain the transparency requirement and make it clear where the PI independence requirements have been applied. And picking up the point that some people made that it's, it's the important thing is to understand that the auditors are independent. Equally, the task force felt it is important to understand the, the standard, in inverted commas, by which that independence is measured. Um, and therefore to understand how the firm has determined whether or not it is independent. And therefore, we believe that the public disclosure of that fact is important. And the proposed text in R400.18 is intended not to tie the IAASB's hands in terms of saying it's got to be in the audit report. So we have given, if you like, room to explore whether disclosure in the audit report is suitable or whether there is something else. So as I said, go over to the next slide, which probably I'm going to repeat myself now. This is the rationale. I think by retaining the transparency requirement, we do think the public interest is served because in some ways there is going to be a market force on firms to apply the PI independence requirements where it is appropriate because people will see whether or not they have done. Um, and we do believe the firm role is probably going to be limited if the PI definition is properly articulated at a local level. We also felt there are lots of burdens on the firms needing to make an effort to adapt to a new by definition, particularly in the light of the, obviously the new NAS and fees provisions anyway. 
but we do think it's in public interest for stakeholders to be able to understand which standards have been used to assess if the auditor is independent. And regrettably, since the IESPA code has differing requirements for pies and non pies you can only gain that understanding if you're made aware of which of the two sets of requirements have been applied. Given the heightened expectations regarding pies, the, the task force felt that was best achieved by public disclosure of when the reply requirements have been applied. There was some suggestion we should also make it clear when they've not been applied. We felt on balance that was not necessary because if you, absence of explicit mention of pies, other references to the ISBA code could then implicitly indicate it's the non pi requirements that have been applied and we could make that clear in the way we talk about it but we felt that having to expand and say non-pi and then you'd have to worry about for non-pies people understanding what a pi definition is in the first place to understand if you like whether or not they uh, they understood what the requirements that have been applied were so that is where we have ended up um and again I would be interested in the board's views on our proposals. And uh, if you flick over to the next two slides, you can see what we are now proposing in terms of both the, uh, what we've now reverted back to application material on the role of the firms to determine uh, whether to apply the high independence requirements and then the public disclosure, which is uh, in R417 as, oh, sorry, 18 as now is. So if you can go over two slides because the next one is just say what questions I want to ask. Flip forward two slides and the next one. So there you can see what we are proposing and I'd just like to get the, the board's views on those. Board members, please raise your hands if you have comments. Yes. Song Nam? No. Yeah. Oh, I agree with the proposed revision to R400.18, but I'm, I hear I have one comment and or question. When I, uh, this is, this relates to the reference, paragraph 400.8 in 418, when I read, the two paragraph, paragraphs together, it looks like these two, these two do not match well. I think that's because of the change of the whole focus from treating an entity to treating an entity of, as a pie to whether pie independence requirements have been applied. I think there needs to be a fine tuning in how to describe these two paragraphs or structure the par two paragraphs. Thank you. Thank you, Sunam. Uh, can I go on, Mike? Yep. Sadia, Sadia, please. Thank you, Stavros. Um, similar to Sangnam, I also have a similar concern on the, the, the change between treatment as pi to apply independence requirements for public interest entities. Um, I see this as a new differentiation into the code. We are now going to start talking about entities that are pies and non pies, and in this small category, hopefully, of entities that apply the independence considerations but are not called pies. And I was wondering if any consideration has been given onto. Well, I've already heard Mike say that wasn't the intention, but I can see that as one of the unintended consequences as we draft this paragraph. Um, I also see there's going to be a possible confusion if people are really going to understand what's the difference between a pie and an entity that applies the independence requirements. Um, and, and I can see how that also goes through into the disclosure paragraph because would people be able to read and understand that? Um, and you've already noted that it's different from the old, uh, the current extent. And I see this as a weakening of the extent. At least the extent gives a requirement for, well, it's not a requirement, it's an encouragement that we con that firms get to consider whether an entity is a pie or not. And this removes that capability of a firm from, from being able to do so. So currently, if a firm is using 400.8 and has identified an entity that they are treating a, as a pie, the wording of 
400.17A1 now says, well, you're not a PI, you're actually just applying the independence requirements for a public interest entity. Shall, shall I respond to both those points? Because I think they're the, yes. one of the same point, really. Um, it was not the intention. Uh, and therefore, I'm very comfortable we take that away and look at it and think about how we might tweak the wording. The reason for moving away from, quotes, treating as a pie is because of the other implications that may have, particularly in the context of working with the IAASB and what is a pie for their standards versus what is a pie for our standards, etc. But I think there is probably a way that we can get to where, you, and I agree with the comment that's been made, I think we can get to a way through where you want to get to by tweaking the wording somewhat to land in, in, in the middle ground, if I can put it like that, because the intention is clearly to say we want a firm to think about whether or not it is appropriate to apply the independent standards that are applicable to pies because of the nature of the entity. And I think if we express it in those sorts of terms, and I'm not going to try and do the drafting on the hoof, but I think that meets your requirement, i.e. they're not saying that it is a non-pie to which they're applying the pie independence requirements. They're determining that it is appropriate to apply the pie independence requirements because of the nature of the entity means that it should be regarded as a pie for that purpose. And then to go on and disclose that fact in those circumstances. So I think that, I think we can get there, put it that way. But I acknowledge the point. Thank you. Uh, Sung Nam, your hand is still up. Oh, I took it down. Okay. Kim. Kim. Thank you. Um, Mike, I have a question on R400, is it 18? Um, one, one might be minor here. We refer to the, let me see, I'm trying to read it from the screen, so forgive me. Um, we refer to the independence requirements described in paragraph 400.8. Is that supposed to be I guess what I was expecting when I went back to look at 400.8, that there would be a requirement that it's pointing to. So are we saying here that the section, the general section is what we should be going back to, or in fact, should it be the requirements, um, which I think, what are they, are 15 and 16? And maybe I'm just reading this totally wrong, but when I went back, it just seemed, it didn't connect for me. And then also with this paragraph, with respect to disclosure, was there any discussion about including where to disclose? I know in fees, I believe we, we refer to the audit report and perhaps some, uh, and other areas. And it, it just kind of stops pretty hard for me without any additional information here with respect to the disclosure. Thanks. Thank you, Kim. Uh, can I go on, um, Mike? Uh, yep. I see Galen, 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 uh, Galen, do you mind if I take Rich Huskin yeah, before you? Absolutely, that'd be proper. Rich. Um, thank you, um, Mike. Maybe, maybe building off of Kim's a little bit. Um, if an entity is not <clears throat> listed, I'm sorry, not publicly traded uh, and doesn't meet the other categories, but it is treated like a pie. Is inclusion in the reports sufficient because those reports may have limited distribution? I guess that's one of the questions and maybe that's something again for, for a basis for conclusion. The second point that I, I guess I have heard brought up by several parties is a concern that one may be in possession of material non-public information about plans to list, and that would be the basis on which one might consider the entity apply the independence provisions related to pies, and that that how to deal with disclosure of just saying even just saying it's a pie, creating the perception speculation that the entity is going to now IPO, and um, and potentially being in conflict with restrictions on disclosing such material information. 
Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Uh, Mike, you want to reflect on those points or shall I go to Galen? Why don't we go to Galen first and then I'll pick those two up because they're pretty similar-ish. Thank you. Yeah, Galen. I, Galen. I, I wasn't going to go where Rich was, but since he brought it up, I mean, yeah, there, there are what is called quiet periods. Uh, when a company is is trying to go public, and so that would be an instance where you'd have to be careful about that confidential confidentiality requirement. What I was really focused on was paragraph 17, though, because the way and and I agree with Sade's, uh observations, but I but I think w for a period of time where we're focused on determining whether we're dealing with a pie, and so I really don't like that word. To, determine in there. But if you had a, a non-PI that, and I, I know we're not using the word treated, but but is in the category of, of, of receiving uh, PI uh, independence, I, I think, why would, why would you have the word encouraged? It seemed to me that it would be required if you were at that point. So encouraged I know, I know we're dealing with application guidance, but in the word encouraged, it seems to me like if, if you're going to be treated as a PI, you have it, it, there's a requirement that you have to follow the requirements that are entailed with that. That's all I had, Michael. And, and oh, and by the way, I mean, uh, it, during the CAG meeting, the, uh, the PIO observer said or made mention of, of this uh, change and said that he felt like it was to satisfy the firms. I, I don't think that was the case. And I thought I'd go on record as, as saying that. I, I think we're trying to get to the right place on this. Thank you. Okay, okay. Mike. Mike? Yeah, if I respond very quickly uh, on Kim's and sort of Richie's first point, um, what we were trying to indicate here was the independence requirements in 400.8 in the sense of 400.8 says there are additional requirements which are applied to the audits of public interest entities, um, paraphrasing. So that was all that was designed to be a cross reference to, but we'll reflect on the wording and see if there's a better way of expressing that. Um, it comes back to what I was saying that we are trying to say there are circumstances where, uh, for whatever reason, it may be idiosyncratic or it may well be that um, there's some isolated instances which are not sufficiently all-encompassing to be picked up by regulators, where firms, when looking at the entity and the nature of the entity, think, actually, this is a, this is a public interest entity. We should be applying public interest entity independent standards to it and make that determination. And if they do that, both in, in that case and indeed in the case where they're required to, because this R400.18 is not just to make the point that they've treated something as a pie when the firm has decided to, but when they have done so. So in other words, they may have been required by law or they may have undertaken their own analysis and determined within the... Um, application material encouraging them to do so, that it is appropriate for them to do so. It encompasses both those aspects. And it's really no more and no less than saying, what is the independent standard by which we have assessed independence? Picking up Rich's other points, um, the, the point on if the report is not widely disseminated, I struggle to think about the context in which um, you're not widely disseminating a report, but you're requiring the auditors to be independent to a pie level because of the interest in that organization's financial condition and hence its financial statements. There may well be examples of that, but I, I would like to suggest they're pretty rare. Um, and therefore I'm not sure how practical that is as a problem. I take the point on confidentiality we can think about how we might build in something in the basis for conclusions around that. Certainly, in my view, it is the lesser of two evils to, um, if you like, 
apply the independent standards appropriate to a pie, but um, not not say you have, if you see what I mean. <laughs> so in other words, people don't think you've applied them, but actually you're being more independent, or sorry, more independent, that's the wrong standard. You are being more rigorous in your application of, of certain requirements than you might otherwise do, but you're just not telling people you've done it. That is a lesser evil than uh, actually not being clear in the vast majority of places about where you have applied them. So let, let us reflect on whether we can we can think about how we might tackle that confidentiality issue. Again, I would hope that it's comparatively rare that the firm is being asked to sign off on a set of financial statements, because this is the context in which we're talking about it, where the company in question has got some plans that it's, it's not telling anybody about. but I'm not denying it could happen. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, I do not see any other hands unless Cam sees others. No, I don't see any other hands, but um, Galen and Rich, I notice your hands are still up and Ken has, has his hand up. Oh, Ken, Ken. Yeah, yeah, I, I wanted to share a bit of the CAD reactions, Mike uh, and Galen, if you don't mind, um, because I think I think it's important to, uh, for the context of this discussion, that the board is informed as to how the CAG weighed on, on this issue of transparency. Uh, by and large, uh, CAG representatives were supportive of the task force's proposal. Uh, and, but I would highlight maybe two key points to raise, or, or perhaps questions. One is, um, uh, one is that uh, a few of the CAG representatives served the auditor's report uh, would be the cleanest way to effect the disclosure. Uh, uh, and the second, the second point was more, more a question to the task force to consider, and, as, and that is whether the disclosure really should be both ways. So, so not only that the high independence requirements have been applied, but also in circumstances where uh, the, the auditor has complied with the non fire requirements, for that not also to be disclosed. So, so they saw they saw merit in, in um, bringing in the other the other side of the disclosure. So that's really just a, a, a uh, important uh, points of input or, or feedback to the task force and for the board to consider. Thanks, Ken. I, and I forgive me. I had forgotten the point. I mean, I have to say my own personal view is, as I say, that it's more important that we make it clear when we've adopted the pie independence requirements than to be explicit as opposed to implicit about when we haven't, just because of the additional burden you would have in terms of how you described that um, and, and the understanding that people would necessarily have to have in order to make any sense of it anyway. I think if people have got, people are looking at the financial statements and audit reports of public interest entities tend to be, uh, certainly at least some of them are more sophisticated users than the people who might be picking up a set of accounts of uh, the, the local sweet shop, which has got uh, a great explanation of how the non-PI independent standards have been applied. I'm not sure it means that much in that context. You might say that applying the I, that the uh, the independence the IS were independent standards doesn't mean much in that context either. And I, I wouldn't necessarily dispute, but I'm not sure it adds a great deal to make it explicit about whether it's PI or non-PI. Okay, I see Caroline. Caroline. Thanks, uh, Ross. Mike, just, I, I, I think just uh, reflecting on um, Rich's point about uh, a company going for listing, right? Um, at that point in time, there's no trading in, in the um, shares. So I don't really see it being an issue. Maybe if it, if it was an M&A transaction, then, you know, um, I, I think that might attract uh, more concern around confidentiality, but but not uh, not a potential listing on its own. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. Thank you. Anyone I, else? I agree with you. If it's not market traded, it's hard to see how it's market sensitive at that point. Um, but anyone else, please. I don't see any other hand. Do you, Cam? No other hands, Mr. Chairman. Mike, back to you. OK, 
Okay, if we can flick on to the next slide. Um, this was just looking at the list of factors the firm might wish to take into account when, as now uh, phrased, it's being encouraged to uh, do it. Obviously, at the time when we asked it on the ED, it was uh, a requirement. There were queries about how the two lists from 400.8 and 416A1 interrelated. There was a point about those charged with governance playing a greater role in the firm's determination and, and focus on objective judgment. Obviously, some of those points uh, kind of um, go away with making it more of encouragement than requirement. Um, if you look at what we are now proposing to do, if you flip on to the next slide, we can go on to the next one. Next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah, excellent. So um, we're only proposing some very minor revisions to the list of factors, um, particularly taking into account the recommendation to revert to application material. We have clarified the firm might consider both lists. Um, the, the, the second list is very much more aimed at, as I say, the individual idiosyncratic cases rather than the broad spectrum of what is and is not a pie. Um, we are of the view that you need to exercise professional judgment. And of course that involves the RITP test. Um, we thought that clarification and explanation of the factors are better addressed in uh, guidance material or basis of conclusions, et cetera. Um, and obviously the code has already got a lot of application material in part 4A about communications with those charged with governance on independence. So we felt that was adequately covered in terms of their role. So, in 417A1, which you go on to the next slide, we have, as I say, largely kept those the same. Um, and apart from the lead-in, which now makes a cross, deliberate cross-reference to 400.9, um, not a lot has changed. So if I can just ask, again, the board to uh, consider uh, what we have done to mm. that particular paragraph. And if you go on to the the next slide but one so flip over the question because the question's obvious uh, board comments please go on to the next slide and the next slide that is what we have done to the text so it's really getting comments on that text board members please raise your hands if you have comments please Any comments, please? Sungnam. You're still mute, Sungnam. I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, I have a small suggestion about the last bullet point, 17A1. So it says about what entities corporate governance arrangement. Uh, at some point, some respondent pointed out it's a little bit tricky to understand the link between entities corporate arrangements and the existence of public interest, interest. So I suggest that we add a clarification somewhere in the basis for conclusion. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I think that was certainly our intention. I mean, for the avoidance of doubt, it's because so much of the independence requirements which are um, mm -hmm. applicable to public interest entities make an implicit assumption uh, in terms of the requirements to discuss matters with those charged with governance that, if you like, there is a go corporate governance structure which facilitates that. That means you're not just dealing with the management the whole time. So or the owners, but we, we can certainly elaborate in the basis of conclusions on that one. Yes. Any other comment or remark, please? I see nothing, um, no, no one else. Mike, there is no comment. Okay. In which case, uh, we're definitely into the home straight now. Um, 
Again, this is just to report back in terms of the um, question around mechanism for disclosure. Um, clearly, um, it was linked to the fact that there wasn't necessarily majority support for transparency. Nonetheless, we do believe for all the reasons we've given, it's appropriate to continue down that road. But nonetheless, there was a lack of majority support for disclosure in the auditor's report of, because of the, the two levels of independence. Well, there are two effective standards. So you, we don't think it's two levels, but there are two standards that you require adherence. There was a concern about the audit reports already lengthy and complex, but again, we would hope that might be addressed. But all of these are things which the IAASB needs to think about. The Just to report back, the IAASB uh, in their July 2021 discussion was generally supportive of exploring uh, transparency in the auditor's report as a part of a possible narrow scope project uh, and the task force obviously believes that is appropriate and we will continue to liaise closely with the IAASB as they take that forward um, so again I was just going to ask if Paul's got any comments on on that aspect and I see Josephine's got her hand up wanting to comment so okay Josephine, please. Thank you. And thanks, Mike. I just wanted to add as well that um, obviously uh, some of the feedback which Mike's already mentioned was that we might also look at other mechanisms uh, for um, transparency. So those other mechanisms might be, for example, the firm's annual report or any other quality management reports, et cetera, that they actually produce or even on their website. Um, so to that extent, we we are going to pursue an our well, hopefully pursue an our scope uh, project to explore with the auditor's report as well as other mechanisms as well. I just wanted to uh, clarify that point, but yeah, that's spot on. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Tavros. Thanks, Josephine. Thank you. And I recognise Kim. Kim. Thanks, Tavros. So, Mike, just just getting um, uh, following up what Josephine had to say. With, and that's fine for the IAASB with respect to this standard. And we end the, the section by saying you are to disclose without any pointing to an auditor's report, websites, you know, basically some of the options that we provided to in the fees document. Depending on the timing of IAASB and, and this standard going out, what would the guidance be for a firm with respect to where to disclose. So I'm just kind of looking for something perhaps a little bit more. And we are obviously slightly um, caught by timing um, because, and Josephine, you might like to comment. I mean, the, the hope is that the IAASB would be able to carry, given it is a narrow scope, um, project if they launch one, which we hope they will do. Um, we are hoping they will be able to conclude their deliberations well in advance of when this became effective. Although we're going to come on to effectiveness in a minute. And, and therefore, in some ways, um, it, it's a bit chicken and egg. We don't want to start pointing out to a whole load, list of potential places if we think the IAASB is going to land on one in the not too distant future. Um, but we will coordinate on that and we can certainly think about um, how we might deal with that. Um, I mean, the, just thinking aloud, clearly we can spell that position out in the basis of conclusions, i.e. the IAASB is examining the most appropriate mechanism and leave it at that. Um, or we could, if the IAASB lands on something, we could um, perhaps look at a very very narrow scope project of our own, really to amend the words before even the thing becomes uh, effective. But if you have other suggestions of how we might tackle it, because I, I say what we didn't want to do is come up with a whole list of places where you might do it, knowing the IAASB was about to hopefully launch a project to say, this is the place to do it, and this is how you do it. <laughs> Mike, I agree with the approach and therefore, of course, coordination in the next few weeks or months will be very important to uh, follow what the IWSB is doing. I see James. James has a raised hand. Uh, no, thank you very much. And, and I just wanted to support the discussion on, on um, by the time we move to December, hopefully having um, a, a, a potentially 
a great assurance around uh, the, the path on disclosure, uh, whether that's, that's finalized or not, but just uh, more more reassurance than less um, before we uh, we finalize this in December. I, I just wanted to actually go back very briefly to the role of the firm and, and the guidance material. Uh, the, my, my general observation that when I look at the encouragement plus the factors is it's, it's likely that there's probably very little circumstances when that consideration is not going to be given. Um, and I appreciate the rationale why it wasn't established as a requirement um, and the concerns uh, as a basis for that in the, um, in the slides. I, I do think it's a judgment and I would encourage in the application material in A1, not just the considerations of whether uh, the entity meets the the, the, the circumstances meet the, um, the likelihood of being treated as, as, a, as a pie for independent uh, considerations, but also some of the judgments that the firm may take um, when making that determination, which I think were articulated in, in the previous slide around the concerns of the rationale of the board for not going to a requirement. I do think that would be a, a helpful in that judgment process by the firms uh, in their encouragement. Thank you. Thank you, James. I don't see another hand raised. Do you, Cam? No more hands, Mr. Sherman. Mike, back to you. Okay, if we can flick on two slides very quickly and the next one. So just in terms of what we were proposing on outreach, clearly people were very supportive. People were supportive at this stage. We don't review the definition of audit client in R420 and they were supportive of our conclusion not to propose any revisions at this stage to part 4B. Um, so I will pause very quickly there um, in terms of, as you know, what we decided we would, um, we decided in terms of definition of audit client to extend it from listed entity to publicly traded entity, but not go further in terms of the other um, areas of pies given the concerns that they might have about ownership structures etc so really just ask the board are they still and i think they were comfortable with all of those proposals in june but any comments at this stage given we're now rapidly heading into the home straight of finalizing this good question uh, good question mike at this point if we flick on two slides you'll see what our definition now looks that's it so that's what we're proposing to do to our 420 so it's it's so say it's extending the listed entity given we've got rid of that term to publicly traded but it's not doing anything else yeah yeah any any comment james your hand is up Sorry, no, I'll pick it in. That's a hangover hand. <laughs> I don't see any comments at this point. Cam, do you? No, no comments. Okay. Right. And then the, the very last question, Stavros, is just around effective date. So we had majority supportive of our proposed effective date. Um, some were suggesting it might get extended, um, but not, I would say, a significant number. Um, as it says there, IOSCO suggested re-exposure if we made significant changes, but I don't think we've made significant changes, so that's not um, uh, relevant. And then we've got, obviously, this linkage with the IAASB PI initiative. So are you, sorry, can I just ask Josephine, are you anticipating approval now in March, or do you think you might even get approval for the project in December, or is that not realistic? It's not realistic, unfortunately, under our current timetable. So it will be um, narrow scope okay. project in March. But some discussion of it in the forthcoming board. So at least we've got a direction of travel indication. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Okay. So that's my last. That's my last bit, Stavros, as to whether the board's got any strong views on effective date. Uh any strong views on effective date? Uh, Ken has this handle. Okay, Ken. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, and I was going to ask the board to maybe withhold judgment on this until we get to the, the December session, just to allow uh, the task force perhaps a, a little bit more time to engage in coordination with the, the other best working group. Uh, um, and, and also awaiting the discussion in October at the other best session on this project. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, as I look at the, uh, the timing or the, or the potential timing of the LABC project with the project proposal in March 2022, um, I would imagine it would be unlikely for, that the IWSB would be able to finalize uh, any changes to standards within a year. So already we've been to March 2023. So potentially, um, potentially we, we, we might be looking to having the IWSB finalize any changes to standards by the end of December, 2023, which would be leaving about a year or so uh, before the, uh, before the revisions come to effect. So the question is gonna be whether the two boards in fact would be leaving about a year or so, you know, on, on a sort of, um, uh, on, a, uh, on an average case basis, whether a year would be, would be sufficient time for, for adoption implementation, uh, especially from the perspective of the firms. And uh, if, if um, the board were to feel that it would be better to play it safer, then that, there might be the option of perhaps uh, considering allowing an extra year uh, of, of lead time for adoption implementation. So, so December 2025 could be, could be a possibility. But I, as I say, it's, uh, I think it would be better to wait um, until we have a chance to hear further from the IWSB and, and to engage in further coordination and then come to the December board and, and perhaps make a decision at that point. I would just observe also, Ken, that um, the IWSB, in terms of its impact on this, on our standards, I mean, it's always, they've obviously got the question about how they look at pies and where they might extend their own standards to pick up any implications there. But in terms of this standard, it is only whether or not uh, the audit report or some other mechanism is where you make the public disclosure. It doesn't take a lot of time to implement that. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, I see Galen. Galen has a hand. Yeah. Uh, on this question, though, Mike, it might not take a lot of time to implement it, but uh, in some cases, you're looking at independence for the entire year. And when you're dealing with mergers, acquisitions, related entities and so forth, you know, this, this could get a little bit hairy. Yeah, no, sorry, we're not, but when the only bit the IAASB has got a, a, an issue around is disclosure. That's the point I'm making. The rest of the standard people know they've got to implement now as well, when we publish it. So it's not, whether you apply the independent standards, it's just around what is the mechanism for the public disclosure of the independent standards you've applied. That's the only bit that the IAASB project is looking at. And it's that element I don't think takes a lot of time to implement, i.e. you've got a requirement to disclose or you're waiting for is to know where and how. Points well taken, thank you, Mike. Hey. Okay. Hey, thank you. I do not see other hands raised. Uh, I think Ken's point has registered. Uh, so, Mike? I'm done. You're done. Okay. Done. Uh, before, before I close this uh, agenda item, let me turn to Robert, if he would like to have a comment now. Robert? Yes, thank, thank you, Chair, and I'm conscious of the time, but I would just like to make a couple of um, concluding observations on the public interest aspects. Um, it's been a very engaging session, very good debate on a number of issues, and thank you to everyone for that. Just on the firms, um, do acknowledge that the public interest um, may still be served with the application material. Uh, in combination um, with requirement on professional judgment and, and ISQM1 requirements as well. I was going to caution about the perceptions uh, here, given that the, um, the firms were really the only group that was uh, that in, in the responses that was against uh, 
the requirement. Um, Kaylin has mentioned that, um, but uh, j just caution about the questions and, uh, and the perceptions that might might arise about it. So some careful uh, explanation and justification is going to be necessary on that. I did have one other question just about um, standing back from the discussion today. Given the decision now to remove pension funds and the CIVs from the definition, have the task force considered whether whether uh, the requirement for firms might to to consider um, uh, uh, whether entities should be treated as a pie might actually become more relevant and necessary within the overall uh, framework, the, mo the model um, of, um, of the local bodies and then the firms, um, just to ensure that entities that have got those public interest characteristics are treated as such. Um, just might want to consider and invite the task force to consider the impact of those two revisions in com combination when um, finalising the proposals. Uh, on disclosure, um, we can certainly be satisfied that these, these are difficult questions. Uh, they're being appropriately considered uh, by the two boards together, and that in itself is very encouraging in, in the public interest. Um, as Mike uh, has said, uh, there's a need for careful coordination going forward, but um, well, uh, there's no doubt that will happen. Um, on the effective date, um, acknowledge Ken's point. Um, certainly, um, I'm sure the POB will understand the implementation challenges, but 2024 does still seem a long way out. Um, and if the um, the need for both boards to to um, uh, complete what they need to do in terms of their standard setting is going to put pressure even on that date, um, that that might be um, of, of concern. And, and so, again, it's just important, and I know the two chairs of both boards have acknowledged the need to, to work to improve timeliness, so um, I, I think it's probably important for me just to encourage that as well. And just finally, coming back to the discussion about the categories, um, I appreciate that the task forces and now the board's judgment is that where it's landed is appropriately responsive to the public interest. That's been made very clear and, and explicit um, in, in the slides and, and in the discussion today. So just to meet those PIOB concerns, which I did mention and need to reiterate about this, um, it will be most helpful just to see how that can be, uh, how that, that judgment, the landing place can be substantiated with the guidance for local bodies about the, the opting in or um, uh, approach um, that, that that's now being um, intended as well as the other mechanisms that were discussed such as the, um, the post implementation review, which of course can be articulated in the, in the basis for conclusions. I hope those concluding comments are helpful Chair and uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to observe and participate. Thank you very much Rob. Uh, Robert, we shall of course consider those points. And uh, as you know, in the near future, I'm going to have a discussion with a PIOB where uh, I think we'll have an opportunity to air some of these uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Uh, Mike, uh, I suppose you don't have another word. So may I close the session now? Definitely. Okay. Uh, so I want to thank you all. This was a very rich uh, and very constructive discussion and a lot of uh, ideas and proposals were put on the table, which I'm sure the task force will do its best to uh, utilize and uh, for the improvement of the standard itself and the public interest objectives of the standard. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, we are running about 15 minutes behind, but um, I do want to touch on the next item and ask Kim to take the floor on updating us on the NAS and fees rollout work. Kim? Yep, thanks Stavros. Hi everyone. Cam, you have the slides, great. Okay, if you can just go on to the next one. We're going to spend just a, a little bit of time updating you on some of the activities 
that the working group has been doing with respect to NAS and fees rollout. And then Dave Johnson will also provide the board with um, an update on some of the social media activities. So next slide, and we'll, we'll try to do it in a pretty efficient time. So the working group has been spending time on looking at the FAQs for both the NAS and <clears throat> NAS and the fees FAQs, and um, I believe that both working both um, task forces have had access to the most recent. FAQs on the subject. Um, I know the NAS met last week to cover a few open items that we wanted to finalize, and I believe FEES is in the same position. So the expectation, I believe FEES is meeting on Wednesday, actually, to look at the FAQ. So hopefully I'm right there. Um, but the expectation would be within the next two weeks for the board to receive the draft FAQs and have an opportunity to comment. There will be ample amount of time given to the board to provide feedback as needed um, with respect to those FAQs. So um, keep an eye out in your inbox for those. Next slide, Cam, please. <clears throat> and just an update once again on the global webinars. As you know, in June, there, were a, there was a fees and, and NAS webinars that were, were provided. Um, they were really well received, strong attendance, um, really excellent feedback we've received on those webinars. So just a little bit of the stats regarding attendance. Next slide, Cam. So as you can see here with respect to the webinars, the participants were primarily the firms um, and the, that's on the bottom. And then one group above are blanks. Um, I actually had to ask Cam, what does blanks mean? And it's really just where folks have decided not to include any of their associations. Um, so a large number. And then of course we have IFAC member bodies, other preparers. So as you can see for both NAS and fees, there was a wide range of stakeholders that participated, were interested in the topics. And um, again, we, we received some really great feedback regarding those webinars. Uh, the, the next, Cam, please. Thank you. And one of the other activities is our continuing outreach with respect to NAS and fees. And Caroline and, and David Clark really are taking the charge here with respect to meeting in um, Asia and Saudi Arabia. And then David will, David and Caroline will meet with the Dubai Financial Services Authority in um, October. I think Dave said October 1st or 2nd. So there is activity. We are talking with stakeholders. Um, stakeholders seem to be engaged. I think there will be a lot of interest in the FAQs when they are available. So uh, with that, before I hand it over to David, I'll just ask the board if there's any questions about the activities, any comments about what we've been doing. Um, any uh, questions, please, comments? Elizabeth has her hands raised. Yes, thanks, Cam. So Kim, uh, it was interesting to see that those charged with governance apparently didn't have uh, much interest in the fees topic, at least when I compare that to the NAS uh, topic. So I'm wondering whether your um, task force or working group, whatever you are, sorry, uh, shouldn't be focusing on uh, going to that specific stakeholder group because the success of that fee standard will depend a lot on the involvement from those charged with governance. So I'm a little bit concerned here. Okay, Th thanks, Elizabeth. Um, perhaps they're included in the blanks or the others, but um, I'll, we'll, we'll take that away for sure. And, and it's, it's a fair point. Thanks. Any other? Okay. No other hands. Okay, 
So, uh, so thanks everyone. I'll, I'll hand it over to David now, Dave, um, Dave Johnson, just to go through some of the social media activities. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank. I'm sorry. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Stavros. Thank you to um, the board for having me, me here today. And um, thank you for allowing me to give you a brief update on the external communications activities related to NAS and fees and the broader Strengthening International Independence Standards Initiative, which is <clears throat> what we call it and housed, when it's housed on our website. And um, we reference that quite a bit in, in our social as well in our external communications. Since April 28th, when we released the pronouncements, uh, IFAC Communications have actively been promoting the initiative through our website and social channels, as well as looking at opportunities for earned media and more pronounced engagement on the on the story from our PAO publications. So uh, I just wanted to point out some interesting data and context uh, that we've seen over the first five months since uh, the April 28th kickoff. Um, since that time, we've had we've seen the final pronouncements been have been downloaded nearly 1,500 times. So this puts both of the publications in our most downloaded resources list during that time frame. And since the summer social campaign, which I'll, I'll mention next, um, the NAS pronouncement in particular, is, it moved into one of IFAC's top 50 most downloaded resources. So, uh, so that's good news. Um, as for the social promotion, we dedicated a portion of our summer schedule to promoting the NAS and fees video series. Um, we, we, uh, the numbers were lower than we wanted coming out of the um, the release, and so we wanted to drive a little more traffic to those videos. Um, we had a lot of high engagement on that, and we're able to get more videos on, uh, more viewers on, on the videos. So we're going to keep looking at different ways to utilize um, all those videos because uh, they're really nice vignettes that tell the, tell the story about um, both pronouncements. <clears throat> We continue to support on social as opportunities arise. Um, for example, the upcoming webinars, FAQ releases, the publications. Um, we place a high priority on sending the right messages when uh, NAS and fees are both there. Um, and we've made some inroads on mentions in trade press and PAO publications, accountancy today, uh, economy uh, accounting today, and um, we're still looking at uh, ways to penetrate the top tier media. Um, and uh, as for next steps, we're continuing to look for ongoing external promotion based on moments of time opportunity. We've got Global Ethics Day coming up as well as International Accounting Day. Uh, and then internally, as I mentioned, any time that um, we see an opportunity, uh, we have the e-news coming out. We mention uh, NAS and fees in that. And then as we release uh, more external documents, then um, we'll use those times to, to look for other ways to engage not only PAOs and, and trade press, but then again, uh, national and top media. And then uh, we're also, again, we work uh, closely, as, as I represent IESBO, we work closely with IFAC and uh, their PR agency, Edelman, who also helps us look for uh, opportunities to, to raise awareness. Thank you. Thank you, David. Back to you, Kim. You well, any um, thanks, Stavros. I think that's it for now on the rollout, rollout activities. Good, good. So thank thank you. you. Let me just briefly see if somebody has a question for a clarification. Anybody have a question or a comment? Well, I don't see anyone. Nor do you, Cam, I imagine. No. Okay. So I think the time has come to close the session. Uh, very briefly, I am uh, <clears throat> quite pleased that the session on Pi has been, as I was saying before, very constructive and very rich. And I really want to thank Mike, the task force, and the staff, Jeff, and the others for uh, not only hard work, but a very efficient processing, understanding and reporting on a complex set of questions on the
exposure draft. I think this has been very helpful to the board, very helpful to me personally to understand the direction of travel and very persuasive. So thank you very much. I also want to thank Kim and David and others who, and, and of course, Caroline, who has been, I know, very active in outreach uh, for their uh, work on the NAS and FEES outreach. Not only is it necessary and effective, but I think it serves as a very good example of what we will be doing, hopefully, when the pipe project is finished, because that's clearly something that will also deserve a lot of outreach work and effort. So thank you all for a good session today. I believe we're meeting in something like 12 hours from now. Uh, so all of you, please try to get as good a rest as you can during these 12 hours. And we'll see you early on Tuesday, um, renewed and with <laughs> new spirit to talk about tomorrow's uh, topics. We will start tomorrow with an executive session. So go well, be well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, get a good rest. See you tomorrow. Thank you all. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.